information about some of our programs. You kind of saw some of that in the video, so I don't want to cover it too much because we have an important agenda to get to. But here's just a little bit about our vision and our mission and our strategy. We want to do basically two, two things. We want to support the community uh, with a whole host of programs, and we also want to invite you to help accelerate research because we've had this hypothesis that we as patients can help drive a faster cure because we are sharing information. Here's a picture of our team. We have some team members here, and um, we're very proud of our team. We, this was up at one of our coach summits, and um, we have a lot of people willing to, to help you in lots of different ways. These are some of our advisors who come from different <coughs> facilities, and they help guide and counsel us in a lot of what we do. And I'll just kind of quickly go through some of our programs just so you're aware of them. And if you have other friends that have myeloma or you have friends that get diagnosed with smoldering myeloma or things like that, please share this information so that they know that there are resources that they can access uh, because some of these things are really crucial to getting good care. So the first is a news website that we have and you can, we, um, we've kind of undergone a name change. We were calling ourselves Myeloma Crowd for a very long period of time and because we decided to do, um, for many reasons, we've changed our name to the Health Tree Foundation. So it's gonna be Health Tree for Multiple Myeloma, and you'll hear that from now on. So we have a news website, a specialist directory. Um, it includes, and we've, we are well known online. We had over 800,000 visitors last year to our website. Um, if you ever wanna share your patient's story on that website, just let me know. And we can, um, about going through transplant or or, you know, we were just talking about going through CAR-T and what that was like. Or anything you want to share, we would love for you to do that. Um, th that site also includes video journaling. So if you want to kind of record your story, you can do it in video, audio, or in text format. Record it for your family and keep it as, a, as an archive for your personal family. Uh, we also have events. So we have a Mountain West chapter that um, is here locally and uh, you can join that chapter with regular online webinar events and we've done a lot of that in conjunction with Huntsman. It's been a wonderful collaboration and uh, we're excited to support you in lots of different ways. Uh, we do, I, the, the original program that I started was the podcast or my, we called it Myeloma Crowd Radio where I interview different investigators and I will be interviewing Dr. Callender about kidney issues uh, in myeloma shortly and other things like clinical trials and how to join them or recent approvals and, and how to navigate with new and upcoming therapies. We do these, which you're at, so we'll, we'll, you'll, you'll experience that today. And then we have coaches. If you're a coach, can you please, please stand up? So Bob and Sherry are both coaches. Diana is a coach. Kyle is a coach, so we're fortunate to have uh, wonderful, we have over 200 myeloma volunteers who are either experienced patients or caregivers. So if you need a coach temporarily about finance, come talk to Diana um, or, or connect with her anytime. So you can connect in any way, in person or online or by phone, and you can pick your, co your own coach. You don't have to be assigned a coach. You can use a coach for a temporary reason and um, Sherry, I also want to call out that Sherry runs a support group in Boise, so she's a coach and a support group leader, so if you're in that area, please talk to Sherry. We also have Health Tree University. Cindy, can you stand? Where's Cindy? Okay, she stepped out for a minute, but Cindy is our, she's here and she's our Health Tree University curriculum director. She's a former teacher, a myeloma patient, a very experienced advocate. And so you'll see us kind of pulling some of these doctors out during after their presentations to ask them certain questions um, that we have in a whole university curriculum. So we've had people who are newly diagnosed say, that I binge watch my way through Health Tree University. And they learned a lot about myeloma in a very short period of time. Because sometimes you come to a meeting like this and you might pick up 20% of what's said, <coughs> go to another meeting, pick up something else. But that takes a long time. So we try to compress it into, into that. We have Health Tree Cure Hub, and I know some of you came to the workshop yesterday. This is a patient portal where you can go in and um, you can track your disease, you can see treatment options, you can find clinical trials that you can join and that are personalized for you. 
and um, you can also participate in research. We did collaborative research with Huntsman asking what do you think is a myeloma cure? We had over 1,500 people respond to the survey and we turned it around, gave the data back to Manny and he, they published on that um, the topic. Uh, we're in the process of doing something similar too uh, based on some data that came out of the International Myeloma Society meeting and so we want to be able to collaborate with these wonderful myeloma academic researchers, accelerate their work, um, save them time and money. And I kind of asked him, how long would that have taken you and how much would it have cost? And he said, for at least a year and a half and over probably $150,000. And we provided that all for free. So that's our interest is let's, let's accelerate this as fast as we can for a, a cure and help them, give them the data that they need. That's anonymized, but help give them the data that they need so they can help with cure us. Um, we do have a clinical trial finder. It is live now on our site and you can find myeloma clinical trials that are open. Please, and we'll probably talk about this today, but please consider clinical trials at every stage of your care. Uh, we have a fitness focus, so if you want to download our app on your phone, it's called Health Tree Moves. You can join a twice a year fitness challenge. Some of the chapters have their own fitness challenge, but it's on Android and um, and iPhone, and, um, and then we are building a 5K series. So we just hosted our first Salt Lake 5K, and we will do that on an annual basis in multiple locations. We also have a new program called Black Myeloma Health, and we have a program director, her name is Diana, uh, no, not Diana Valentine, um, her name is Marcia Calloway-Campbell, and she, will, she is running that program. So we have extra services and resources for these patients. And that's really what I wanted to just kind of share quickly um, before we move on to our next speaker, which is Dr. Sporov. Check, good. All right. Where's Greg? Can you step out? All right, so Jenny, Greg, Health Tree, thank you. Thank you for hosting this round table here at our home, the Huntsman Cancer Institute. I welcome all of you who are here, both in person and online. It's a pleasure to have you. Hopefully today is both educational as well as fun. So I was given the job today to talk about what it is to become a partner with your healthcare team. And my instructions were as follows. One, no Kaplan-Meier survival curves. Those are out. Two, what's the essential knowledge that you need as a patient and family member? Three, what's risk in myeloma? And four, what are the, what's the importance of treatment strategies as we move from diagnosis all the way through relapse and refractory disease. And lastly, I was instructed to talk to you guys like you are coming into my clinic, okay? So that's what I did. <coughs> All right? There we go. So I'm inviting you through the front door into my clinical space. That first step that you take, that's our first opportunity to become partners. Walk through the front door, walk down the long hall, walk into my clinic room. You're scared, anxious, nervous. Nervous and scared to hear that C word, cancer. Even more nervous to hear those two words, multiple myeloma. You walk in, you have medical assistance, you have pharmacists, you have nurses, you're supposed to see this strange doctor with a strange last name like Hoffmeister. <laughs> <laughs> and then you notice that everybody's smiling. And you're like, why is everybody smiling? 
They deal with cancer all day. They're not supposed to be smiling. They're smiling because they're waiting for you. Our job is to put our arm around you, bring you into our family, grow our trust, and to become partners along your journey with multiple myeloma. In my humble opinion, that trust is gained through communication and education. So, a lot of people give me a hard time because when you come into my clinic for the first time, I have this patient exam table. And you think you're supposed to get up on the table. That's not what it's for. It's my tapestry. That's where I do my art. It's where I tell the story. I am no artist. I'm, in fact, I'm a horrible artist, but I do my job to be my best Bob Ross. So we sit down, we talk about, we have some small talk, get to know one another, go through the history and physical, and then I start talking about what you need to know about multiple myeloma. I was thinking, okay, well, I could probably try to get fancy with my PowerPoint and put together some kind of animation or whatever else, and then I decided, why not just show you what it looks like? So I went into the clinic workroom or clinic room, and I put this together. So this is how I describe myeloma to my patients. And there is poetic license that goes along with this, okay? And so I've, I try to conceptualize for the patients and give them some ideas and introduce them to some vocabulary. So I start out by saying, your bones are the factory. Your bones are the factory for all the cells that float around the blood. You have white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets. If you cut yourself, platelets bind together. They form a clot and they stop bleeding. Red blood cells carry oxygen around the body. You don't have enough red blood cells, you get tired. You don't have enough oxygen. And then you have white blood cells, and white blood cells make up our immune system. Okay? They clear junk, viruses, bacteria, other junk out of the system. There's two components of the immune system. You have the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. So what does that mean? Well, the innate immune system is the first responders, the ambulance drivers, if you will. The adaptive immune system is your memory immune system, more specialized, maybe like your doctor. The way I try to introduce this concept is through the idea of a vaccine. Most, if not all of us, in fact, all of us in this room should have the flu vaccine. Okay, so the flu vaccine is just us injecting some dead flu virus into your system. Okay, these first responders looking around, they see dead flu virus. They say, dead, dead flu virus doesn't belong here. Let's get rid of it. So they do. Those cells get rid of the dead flu virus. But they also tell these guys, hey, listen, we just saw the dead flu virus. We want you to remember it. Because if you get infected with the live flu in the middle of the winter, you want your immune system to recognize it. The way the immune system recognizes it is through this thing called an antibody. An antibody is a protein. It has another name, it's called an immunoglobulin, or an Ig. There's a bunch of different types of antibodies or immunoglobulins. You have IgG, IgM, IgA, IgD, IgE. Ricky, Bobby, Tommy, Joey, Steve. <laughs> Just different names for different types of antibodies. Now, this antibody is made up of two components. You have this bigger part, that's the heavy chain, and then you have this other part, it's called the light chain, and that can be either kappa or lambda. Okay, what does this look like? It looks like, sorry, I have a sport coat on. It looks like this, okay? These antibodies float around your system, all right? The fingers, right, recognize flu, okay? So these guys float around your system looking for things, surveillance, all right? Hopefully that makes sense. Now, a very important concept is that these antibodies these immunoglobulins, this protein, is made by this cell called the plasma cell. And the plasma cell is a type of white blood cell, part of the adaptive immune system. This plasma cell normally lives here in the bones. When you become infected with something or you have some kind of inflammation, these cells wake up and they start throwing out these antibodies into your system. If you have myeloma, MGUS, smoldering, at some time, one of these normal cells got a mutation. 
all right? And that mutation causes that cell to act abnormally. So what do they do? They're always on. They always make that protein. Now the bone marrow is this beautiful place. It's like a tropical forest. And the bone marrow loves these cells. And these cells love the bone marrow. So they talk back and forth. I like you. I like you. Things happen. They start making more of each other. All of these cells, good, I like the snicker, that's the idea. <laughs> all of these cells are the same, okay? And they're all making the same type of protein or the same type of immunoglobulin. In doctor talk, we call that monoclonal. Monoclonal stands for one clone. So these are monoclonal plasma cells that make the same type of protein, a monoclonal protein. We also call that the M spike. Following so far? Very good. If you have a few of these cells in your bones, not causing any problems, you have this entity called MGUS, monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance. If you have some more of those cells, still not causing any problems, that's smoldering myeloma. <coughs> At some point, those cells may cause problems, and at that point, we call that multiple myeloma. Now, every patient who has multiple myeloma started here, then went here, then went here. But not every patient with MGUS or smoldering myeloma develops multiple myeloma. So what do these cells do? These cells sit in the bones and they secrete a substance. The substance eats away at bones like termites eat away at wood. Okay. When that happens, what do we see on imaging? We see bone lytic lesions. And that makes our patients more susceptible to fractures. Because the bones are a factory, they have limited resources. So if you have so many of these bad plasma cells in your bones, right, you can't, you don't have enough resources to make red blood cells and platelets. So what can happen? Well, you can have anemia. You can have a reduced number of red blood cells. And what happens? Patients begin, are tired because they don't have enough oxygen, okay? What else can happen? Well, if, sorry, Bob Ross. Um, if your bones are being chewed up by termites, well, bones are made up of calcium, so that calcium can get spit out into the peripheral blood, and you can have high calcium. <coughs> the proteins that I was telling you about, they can be sticky, and those proteins can glob up in the kidney. The kidney is essentially a pipe with filters on it. So if you have this sticky glob of goo, it can block up that pipe and you can have renal failure. That's the end organ damage associated with multiple myeloma. So risk, so we now understand what multiple myeloma is. When you see your doctor, we're trying to understand how your myeloma is gonna behave. All right, so we look at the RISS, or Revised International Staging System, to try to get an idea as to how your myeloma will behave. This staging system is based upon a bunch of labs. It's also based upon what we call fish cytogenetics, which is an analysis of your mutations that are associated with those bad cells in the bones. Going back to my drawings, this is what I put on a piece of paper, okay? Stage one, sensitive disease. It's less aggressive. So we need to give less aggressive long-term therapy. Three, resistant, higher risk disease. Because the cells are more resistant to our current therapeutics, we have to give more aggressive long-term therapy. That's risk. The most important time, in my opinion, to assess risk is at diagnosis. That's when we get an idea of what your treatment plan is gonna look like. How do we need to approach your myeloma in order to keep your disease under control for the longest period of time possible. So this is what happens when you first come in. This is how our brains think. So we diagnose you, we look at risk, and then we assess your fitness. We try to understand if you would be eligible for a high dose of chemotherapy in the form of an autologous transplant. And then once we make that determination, we move forward. Start some drugs, either we continue those drugs or start those drugs consolidate your response 
with this high dose of chemotherapy and a transplant, and then move on to maintenance therapy, all with the goal of controlling your disease. If we are able to kill those cancer cells, those cancer cells can't keep eating away at your bones. If we can kill those cancer cells, they're not making the protein that can cause kidney damage. And then, as you would expect, we want to maximize disease control. We want to keep tabs on those bad cells. We want them to be quiet for as long as possible. So this is our myeloma toolbox. I won't go through it in deep detail because we have a couple of speakers that will do so, but I point out that we have a lot of drugs. And our job is, as your provider is to try to figure out which drugs to use at which time to make sure that you can live as long as possible with the best possible quality of life. And as you can see here, this is not a Kaplan-Meier curve if Greg is watching. This is just to point out that we're improving. As you guys know, because you're savvy, we have a lot of new drugs, a lot of technology, a lot of growth in myeloma. And what's that leading to? That's leading to better survival in our patients. That's my introduction to the day. I'm really, really happy to introduce my colleagues that will be joining me over the course of the day. We have Dr. Craig Hoffmeister, who taught me everything I know about multiple myeloma. Happy to have him from Emory University. Dr. Natalie Callender, who's the director of the myeloma program at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Christina Gowan will be joining us from a campsite, I believe, uh, somewhere in Arizona this afternoon. Uh, and then Mani, uh, Dr. Mani Moyedin is our newest partner here at the Huntsman. He's currently on service, so when he's done rounding, he'll be down here. So please join me in welcoming our uh, esteemed colleagues. Okay, can you hear me? Good morning. Uh, my name is Craig Hoffmeister. I am uh, living in Atlanta, which has exactly the same temperature it is here, um, and uh, which I didn't expect. Oh, would you like? Okay, fine. <coughs> so uh, I'm here to talk a little bit about some of the basics about myeloma and uh, how to think about side effects uh, that many patients have uh, when they're in the midst of, of initial treatment. Um, so uh, you get a little bit of this organization about how things start from Dr. Sporov, and I'm just gonna continue on that same idea, is that MGUS and smoldering myeloma, two of the world's dumbest names, uh, basically say that you have a rogue group of immune cells that aren't currently attacking you and don't seem like they're about to, and hence you don't bother them. And smoldering is not myeloma on simmer. It's not a cooking analogy. I hear this all the time and that's not what this is. Basically, at some point in every patient, MGUS and smoldering myeloma will eventually lead to multiple myeloma, but you might have to live 200 years to get there. So it's a predilection towards degeneration, which is myeloma, but it doesn't happen in the majority of patients with MGUS and in many patients with smoldering myeloma. So many patients sit right over here and never progress to myeloma. And when these cells start trying to kill you, that's why we call them myeloma. And basically, they either chew at your bones, they fill up your bone marrow, or they make proteins which clog your kidneys and lead to kidney failure. The majority of myeloma patients present tired, anemic, with a fracture, and with some evidence of kidney failure. The wheels have fallen off the wagon, and they feel horrible. Now, 
we, we made this more complicated with more acronyms. Oh, but we did it for a good reason. We wanted to avoid patients from suffering. So we wanted to try to find patients who currently were, didn't look like their mutated plasma cells were affecting them, but looked like they were high risk to have that occur. And so we added in some additional characteristics. We said, hey, if you have 60% of these cells in your bone marrow, but they're still not attacking you, maybe we should just treat this as myeloma. If you have abnormalities on MRI in multiple locations, maybe we should just treat this as myeloma. Or the worst one is if your serum-free light chain ratio is greater than 100, then maybe we should just treat you as if you have myeloma. These are not perfect. These are predictions. These are trying to prevent patients with smoldering myeloma from showing up in, their in the clinic with two compression fractures and saying to the doctor, hey doc, I don't think I have smoldering myeloma anymore. These compression fractures suggest I have myeloma. Do you think you want to treat this? That's not what we want. We never want anyone to have a compression fracture because you can never take that back. And so trying to change this to make it slightly more complicated, to treat these patients before they have clear evidence that their myeloma cells are attacking them, that's the purpose of making this more complicated. And majority of patients basically show on the left-hand side, they present with back pain. If you look closely uh, here, this is this spot here. This is the cartoon, this is the MRI, a squished vertebra. This is what causes pain. And if you stick a needle right in here and lay that out on a slide, this is wall-to-wall -wall myeloma. And myeloma cells in a cartoon make these monoclonal proteins which get filtered by the kidney and scar the kidney as they go through the kidney. These myeloma cells can also fill up the bone marrow and chew at the outer structural portion of the bones. That's where we all store our calcium. As they chew through the calcium, they weaken the bones and gravity is always pushing down. It puts us at risk of developing fracture. And then filling up the marrow can increase your risk of infections and worsen anemia. This is a busy slide. I'm not going to go crazy on this, but basically we have very clear criteria for what makes you into patients with multiple myeloma and the sister disorder, AL amyloidosis. AL amyloidosis is essentially patients with MGUS that have a protein that just happens to get deposited in cell, in organs in a patient and lead to oftentimes kidney failure, heart failure. These patients don't, are usually not attacked in their bones. They don't have horrible anemia. They don't have their bone marrow filled up with these plasma cells, but the protein itself, the circulating protein, is what's killing these patients with heart failure and kidney failure. So I always think of myeloma cells as termites, because no one likes termites. Actually, no one likes cockroaches. It's, that's more of an Atlanta thing. Uh, <coughs> Oh, what a pain. Uh, but anyway, back to work. Um, so termites are, they are, this is the myeloma cells, and they're chewing at the foundation of your house, which is your skeleton. And that leads to holes in your bones and puts you at risk for fracture. Uh, chemotherapy is like these little termite killers. And the reason we are here now and we're not where we want to be is because most of these killers kill the worker bees, and they don't kill the queen bee. And that's what we need to do. We need to push towards new and novel treatments that can get rid of all the myeloma cells, not just the worker bees, because we're pretty good at killing the worker bees. Stage. We misuse the word stage in myeloma. Uh, so breast, breast cancer, colon cancer, lung cancer, prostate cancer, all of them use the word stage to mean where is your cancer. Uh, and we use the word stage totally differently. And we are all, always all upset that patients don't understand why we, what, what we, mean, we mean with stage. 
So stage one myeloma means you are expected to have easier to treat myeloma. In myeloma, where myeloma cells are spread throughout the body at diagnosis, the location is not linked to survival. Location is not uh, what happens, is not relevant in myeloma, but it's very relevant in breast cancer, colon cancer, lung cancer, prostate cancer, metastatic breast cancer is much worse than breast cancers just in the right upper outer quadrant that you can cut out and cure. So in myeloma, it's spread out for stage one, stage two, stage three. Where the cancer is in myeloma is not relevant for survival. So staging for us is solely linked to what kind of myeloma do you have? Do you have more difficult to treat myeloma or easier to treat myeloma? And so the ma vast majority of patients, 60% of them, are right in the middle. We're not quite sure whether they have easier to treat disease, stage one, or harder to treat disease, stage three. So stage one, staging in myeloma is complicated, but stage here is synonymous with risk. High risk myeloma, which is more difficult to treat, which is more, has a uh, more predilection to become resistant to treatment. It doesn't make it easier. We have four staging systems that I document in every note. So that adds to the confusion for patients. Uh, but staging is all trying to get at the idea of what kind of myeloma do you have? There are lots of treatments, and if you think of paradigm shifts, this slide is where I wanna, I wanna sit for a second. So it started out a little bit with steroids. Actually, it started out with Coca-Cola in a clinical trial that I'm not gonna talk about. But <laughs> that said, steroids are, are the drugs we love to hate. They make every myeloma treatment work twice as well to the detriment of the patient. Uh, proteasome inhibitors, you guys are familiar with Velcade, Kyprolis, Ninlaro, they attack the myeloma cells. Imids or cell mods, you've heard of Revlimid and Pomalist and you will hear about Ibertamide and others. These attack the inner workings of the myeloma cell and all of these drugs affect what goes on inside the cell. Now, Newer things, CD38 antibodies like Darzelex and Sarclisa, CAR T cells and bispecific antibodies, these look at what's on the outside of the myeloma cell. It doesn't matter what's going on inside. What matters is what proteins, what vulnerabilities are present on the outside of the cell. And CAR T cells work because they look for a particular protein on the cell surface and they look to try to find myeloma cells that are vulnerable, that haven't surrounded themselves with an army. So I have to tell this one joke. I always tell this joke. I love this joke. The idea is that when you do a bone marrow biopsy and you pull myeloma cells out of a patient and you put them on a dish, they just die. They die in 90% of the time. And this is just like my in-laws. My in-laws have created a situation that promotes their survival. And if you pull them out and drop them over here, they're just gonna do terribly. This is not gonna work out well. My in-laws have created this bone marrow to support their growth and to continue their long life. Myeloma cells are just like that. And CAR T cells, everyone wonders, wait a minute, if they all, if myeloma cells all express this protein, why don't CAR T cells work for everyone? And what happens is that they're so good at creating that system around them to support their, uh, to support their growth, the CAR T cells don't even have a chance to be successful. So CAR T cells work for the majority of patients, but some myeloma cells are so good at creating a protective cocoon around themselves sometimes they're not always effective. So while this new paradigm of drugs is very effective, it's not 100%. Okay, on average for my, most of my myeloma patients who present fatigued, anemic, with fractures and kidney failure in the ER wondering what happened, 
most of us are trying to treat them until things are as good as they're going to get, until the myeloma patient is doing as well as they can. And this is usually takes two to four months and usually involves a variety of treatments and a variety of drug cocktails that are very complicated. These are the same drugs we just talked about, but they're pills, they're shots, and they each have different potential complications and side effects that we're going to go over in a subsequent slide. Autologous transplant is sometimes used for patients, and this usually is essentially just high-dose intravenous malfilan, which is a chemotherapy drug, and we're transplanting your own stem cells right back to you, but those cells don't get exposed to malfilan, and hence they are able to quickly reconstitute your bone marrow so that you have a very short time where you don't have much of an immune system. And finally, most patients are usually on single drug Revlimid maintenance, and this adds another period of time, uh, usually 20 months for the Revlimid maintenance and about 30 months for transplant is how long. And when I think of how long, when I think of how good treatments are, I think of their value. How long do they keep the myeloma quiet if they're not gonna cure? And how much pain and suffering do you have to go through for that uh, amount of disease control? And when you think about disease control, all right, so this is my most complicated slide. It has the most amount of jargon. Just kind of breathe through it here. It's gonna be okay. Um, so the idea is how long will your myeloma be in control? And I took a whole bunch of national trials uh, and how long did they keep the myeloma quiet? So this is Revlimid and dexamethasone. If you keep doing that forever until the myeloma is resistant, that buys you 24 months of disease control on average. If you do Revlimid and dexamethasone and an autologous transplant and then you stop, that's 34 months. RVD and then RD, that's 41 months. RVD, autologous transplant, and Revlimid for just 13 months, 47 months. Dara, Revlimid, and dexamethasone until resistance, that gets you 66 months. And then we'll just go to the bottom here. Dara, RVD, Darzalex, Revlimid, Velcade, dexamethasone, autologous transplant, and Dara and Revlimid together for two years, followed by Revlimid, will likely be around 90 months on average. So things are getting better. The drug cocktails are better able to control the myeloma, but it is more complicated and it is more drugs. All right, this is my second most complicated slide. Uh, so treatment for the newly diagnosed, and I think that we should personalize treatment, and that's the other paradigm shift is that not everyone should get the same treatment because we want to bring forth the best value, the best disease control with the least amount of side effects. So for patients who have high risk disease, these are patients in general who have stage three disease or other markers that suggest they're going to be very treatment resistant. These patients are very challenging. They will get three or four drug initial treatment, autologous transplant, and ongoing treatment thereafter. This autologous transplant I classify as low value. It doesn't provide very much disease control, but has the same amount of side effects, no matter what kind of myeloma you have. In patients with low risk or easier to treat disease, they'll often get four drug induction, transplant, and then if they're in a deep remission, we're gonna stop treatment. And there, the transplant is high value. Same amount of side effects, but their disease is more likely to respond, more likely to stay quiet. None of this is curable. So it does, we're looking to try to find the least amount of side effects for the best amount of disease control. I'm going to keep going in the interest of time here. All right, everyone insults myeloma physicians for having ABCDs of myeloma treatment. We love to put an acronym on everything, and we think, and you think it's to exclude you, and honestly, it's just hard to say all these uh, chemotherapy combinations. Dara RVD is these four drugs. Dara KRD is these four drugs. It gets confusing, and some of these acronyms uh, I, I put on this slide just to give you some comfort with it. 
All right, this is Catherine Maples. Uh, she is a clinical pharmacy specialist that I work with, and she worked in collaboration on the following couple slides on side effects. Ravlimid. Ravlimid is one of those drugs that if you get a rash to Ravlimid, that does not mean you're allergic to Ravlimid. It is one of the few drugs where you can say that and kind of roll your eyes like, makes, like my 17-year-old rolls her eyes when I talk to her. It's a 17-year-old eye roll. This is not an allergy. This is how the drug works. It stimulates some of the immune system. So most of the time, these rashes can be taken care of by taking a non-sedating antihistamine like Claritin, reducing the dose, and then ev eventually decreasing the dose if need to, if it becomes pesky in the long term. Rash, if you ignore it, can be horrendous. So please communicate with your clinic staff so that they know you're having a rash and can guide you appropriately. This is not the time to be stoic. Diarrhea, also not the time to be stoic. In general, responds some to Imodium, but oftentimes you need something to help the gut work and reabsorb bile acids. So we use a lot of Wellcall and Colested to try to allow patients to take Ravlimid without irritating diarrhea. This is very much one to six tabs per day. This is very much a user-defined amount of drug. It's however much you need to get one to two soft bowel movements a day. That's what we're looking for. Sedation uh, is hap is happens that most patients get tired for taking Revlimid, so we suggest to take it at night. Chemobrain is poorly understood, poorly uh, assessed, and sometimes responds to reducing the dose. Nocturnal cramping or cramping in general. Generally, if you're not taking Revlimid, hydration isn't going to help. But if you are taking Revlimid, hydration can make a difference. Uh, and so, uh, and blood clots, obviously, patients uh, need, need proper uh, anticoagulation. Uh, IMIDs and kidney failure. Some doctors will say, oh, you have kidney failure, I can't use Revlimid. That's not true. You just need to dose reduce the Revlimid appropriately because Revlimid's cleared by the kidney. There's almost no patient we can't give Revlimid to if they have moderate kidney disease, severe kidney disease, or they're on dialysis. You can dose reduce the Revlimid and uh, make uh, it tolerable. Proteasome inhibitors, things like Velcade and Kyprolis, these drugs increase your risk for shingles. Shingles is a terrible rash I'd never want you to have. But you can take care of shingles and have almost 100% uh, prevention success by taking Valtrex or Acyclovir. Uh, again, these drugs give you either diarrhea or constipation, whichever you don't want. That's what they tend to give you. It's so annoying. Uh, so say some basic stuff will usually get you through it. The big thing for Velcade is it causes tingling and numbness in your hands and feet. It's cumulative. It's not the time to be quiet. If you have tingling, if you feel cold in your extremities and it's changing with treatment, please tell us, let us know. We want to prevent this tingling and numbness and pain from getting worse. I have literally had patients say, ah, you're busy, I didn't want to tell you. This is when they were being wheeled into the clinic because they couldn't walk anymore. So please tell me this is, if this is going on, if I'm not seeing you, because I want to make sure this does not get out of control. And their way, the best way to, have, to treat peripheral neuropathy is to prevent it. Um, Velcade, uh, through its effects on the autonomic nerves, can decrease uh, blood pressure. Carfilzomib or Kyprolis. Uh, increases your risk of hypertension, high blood pressure, increases your risk for heart failure. Oftentimes for patients who are newly diagnosed, they're often given the question of, hey, do you want a 30% risk that you'll have uh, peripheral neuropathy or a 3% risk of heart failure? 30% risk of uh, neuropathy is with Velcade, a 3% risk of heart failure with Kyprolis. And we don't know which you're going to get. And a lot of times in myeloma, there's a lot of choices that you don't want to make where we have imperfect data. 
uh, drug interactions, I saw this and I just get annoyed. It's go ahead, have some vitamin C, drink some green tea, whatever you've seen on the blogosphere is crap. So you can go ahead and have some green tea and vitamin C, it's not going to affect either one of uh, these medications. Lastly, just a couple uh, um, asides, CD38 antibodies do uh, depress your immune system. They increase your risk of infection, they increase your risk of fatigue, so you need to definitely uh, at never forget about shingles prevention in patients on, with these antibodies. CAR-Ts can uh, affect your normal plasma cells, so trying to give monthly intravenous immune globulins to decrease your risk of infection often go, can go on for months and even up to a year after CAR T just to, just to try to decrease risk of infection. Blenrep is a uh, anti antibody drug conjugate uh, and sometimes it's better to start a low dose because this drug can be very effective but it can it cause uh, corneal toxicities or corneal side effects on your eyes causing blurry vision uh, and while you get a eye visit prior to each and every dose, starting at a slightly lower dose can somehow, uh, can in many ways prevent uh, eye, talk, eye damage. And then Expovio or Selenexor is a very uh, challenging drug to take. Don't forget to take your anti-nausea drugs, at least for the first week, because if you're one of those few patients that can tolerate this with almost no side effects, that's great but the rest of us are going to have side effects, one of them being nausea, and taking these preventive or pre uh, prophylactic anti-nausea medications makes some good sense. All right, this is one, this is a cartoon slide. I love cartoons. I don't know how I would have gotten through med school without cartoons. Uh, but this is a CAR-T, and I just, there, more folks are gonna talk about CAR-Ts here, but I just put in the cartoon because it's nice. Basically, a myeloma patient you will take T cells out of the myeloma patient through their blood. These T cells are forced uh, to become myeloma warriors. They weren't warriors when they came out of in the blood, but they're forced to express a markers on their cell surface so that they have to attack myeloma cells whether they want to or not. These cells are infused back into a patient and what happens is that these CAR T cells connect up to the myeloma cell and lead to the myeloma cell death. So that's how really a CAR T cell works. All right, this is my dog, this is Captain America. He eats anything. Um, but anyway, thank you so much for your time. Well, let me take this off. Can everybody hear me? Yes? Okay. Well, I thank you very much. Thank you, Jenny, for inviting me to be here in this beautiful place. Uh, I come from Wisconsin, where, where this morning it was 30 degrees, and the high is going to be 42 today, so just, just so you know. But um, they gave me a lot of latitude about how to approach this topic about what's new for relapsed myeloma. So I want to start by showing you a picture that gets shown at lots of conferences. Now, uh, you heard from Craig, uh, we've got some very good initial treatments now, and it, one of the best things about working in myeloma for a number of years is it's really common now to see people who had initial treatment and not get, need to get anything else for seven, eight, even nine years. And so that's really happening now, much more than it ever did. But most people with myeloma are gonna have a relapse at some point, and unfortunately, some people are gonna have more than one. So let's talk a little bit about what, what that really means. Uh, we're gonna talk about if you've had multiple relapses, what you should be potentially thinking about for treatment. We also wanna talk about CAR-T a little bit, and then what are some of the new things that are on the horizon? 
But I want to talk a little bit about what do we mean, what kind of approaches there are for relapse. So this is a slide. Basically, if you've had myeloma and you're getting your first treatment for relapse, your providers actually have a lot of pretty good choices. Um, and so these are just to show you a couple of different trials. So this one is daratumumab with lenalidomide and dexamethasone. Big difference from lenalidomide and dexamethasone alone. This is uh, looking at carfilzomib with daratumumab. And this is looking at actually pomalidomide and Velcade versus Velcade alone. So there are really good choices for all three of these in what we call first relapse. But if you've had myeloma for a while and you've had exposure to what we talk about as three classes, meaning an imid drug like lenalidomide or pomalidomide, an antibody drug like Dara or Isituximab, and you've had a proteasome inhibitor like Velcade and Carfilzomib, the results get a lot worse, unfortunately. And this is a, a study that was done uh, at a bunch of academic centers. And, and this is basically survival, unfortunately. So if you've now been exposed to these three classes and you're getting refractory, meaning you're not responding, survival is pretty bad. And so we definitely need new treatments for people who've been through uh, all of these three classes. So if you've been told you have a relapse, it's important to you know what that actually means. So we have some very formal definitions of what relapse is. And actually, I'm sorry, that's a typo that should say grams. So the International Myeloma Working Group, kind of the Bible, if you will, for myeloma, says that relapse means you have more than 0.5 grams of an M protein, you have more than 200 milligrams of monoclonal protein in a urine, a 24-hour urine, or you have more than 10 milligrams per deciliter increase in light chains. So there are a bunch of people who actually meet this and feel fine. But that's probably a little bit different from people over here. And these are people who actually have something happening. They're coming in, maybe they have a new bone fracture or anemia, or their kidneys aren't working again, or they're having high calcium. And so these people, I think we all agree, actually need to have something done right away. Whereas some of these patients, you can just kind of watch for a while. If somebody says you have a refractory relapse, what that means is that you are relapsing on treatment or you are within two months of stopping treatment. Now we really think that these two groups require different approaches, but what your team should be doing if you're facing relapse is basically R&R. &R. So that's reevaluation and review. So we have to take measure of what's going on with you again. And so that means certainly running a lot of the standard tests. But if, if you never had what we call advanced imaging, something more than a bone survey, at the time of relapse, you really should ask for something more. So whether that's a whole body low dose CAT scan or an MRI or a PET scan, they really, really help us to figure out how much myeloma you have. Everybody loves bone marrow biopsies, I'm sure, but, but they really can help us take better care of you because sometimes that's one of the only tools we have to, to figure out how much myeloma you have around. Now, this actually is turning out to be a bigger thing than, than it used to be, because if you go back only to 2010, around that time, the average survival of people with myeloma was somewhere around three to five years, so, so really pretty bad. Uh, nowadays, we see people with myeloma living much more than a decade. So if they come in and there's a new spot someplace, or, or what we call lesion, you have to make sure that that's really myeloma, because what we're starting to see is people who actually have something else going on. So maybe their myeloma is fine, but now they have, for example, prostate cancer, or something else that, of course, wouldn't respond at all to myeloma treatment. Then you have to review what's going on. So you heard from Craig about side effects. Unfortunately, some of these side effects can hang on. And so if you're picking new treatment, you have to think about what, you're, what, what, what the person is experiencing. Do you have really bad neuropathy? Uh, so probably don't want to get Velcade. Um, how about, how close are you to clinic? So we talked about this is the one area Huntsman for many, many hundreds of miles around. So if we ask you to come into a clinical trial that you got four visits a week, unfortunately that just may not work out for you. Do you have a caregiver? So if somebody, if something is really complicated, can somebody help you with that? Or if you're going to get a drug that means you got to get a whole lot of Benadryl, for example, maybe that's not going to work out either because you got to drive home. And finally, what about the term we like to use is comorbidities, but do you have other medical problems that we're going to have to take into account when we pick treatment? Okay. 
So one of the things I just want to talk to you about is a phenomenon that we're seeing more and more, and this is something called either light chain or non-secretory escape. So what does that mean? Well, you guys all probably know that we use these protein levels to diagnose myeloma, but what tends to happen as people go through relapses is they stop making as much protein, and so that's just something that we have to be aware of. So, whoops, I'm sorry, this is a person who had a very high M protein and, at, at diagnosis, so they got treated, it all went away, but now they're relapsing, and look at that M protein, it didn't change at all. So if all you were looking at was that to pay attention to, you would get faked out that something is really going on. Instead, what this person's myeloma chose to do was just elevate light chains. And that happens quite a bit as people go through uh, their myeloma uh, course. And in particular, there are some people who stop making almost pro any protein at all, and that gets very challenging for us to help figure out if something's going on. The other thing about that advanced imaging I mentioned, this is a person that I saw who came in uh, on treatment with really particularly bad back pain. Now this person has what we call compression fracture, so you can see this scooping. Instead of being like a tuna can stacked up, this is not normal, but this is an old change. This is what the person had when their myeloma was diagnosed, but they had terrible back pain. However, we did an MRI, and unfortunately, what we were able to find is these holes that are myeloma, and this person unfortunately had all of their sacral vertebral body replaced by myeloma, and that's what was causing the pain. But if you had only done a bone survey, you would have missed that. Okay, so let's talk about some of those things that are available right now, plus what's coming in the future. So I'm gonna to touch upon just a few of these. We're gonna talk about CAR-T, we're gonna talk a little bit about Belantimab. I want you to take, take away from all this, there is so much in development that we are very, very excited about. And even though, as Craig mentioned, we know that most people are gonna have to deal with a relapse, we think we're going to have more and more answers for that. So why does every new treatment seem to target this B cell maturation antigen or BCMA? And that's because it's really important. Uh, for one thing, it, it helps the myeloma cells stay alive. So if you take away BCMA, those cells really can't d grow and divide and uh, multiply and even make uh, antibodies. Um, we also know that BCMA is relatively confined to B cells, and those are the cells that eventually turn into myeloma cells, and it's not really found in other places in the body, which makes it a really good target if you're developing a drug to get at that. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so, so belantimab. So belantimab was the first BCMA-approved therapy that we had, and basically what it does, it is an antibody connected to a drug called monomethyl aristatin F, or MMAF, and so what, what we think works primarily is that the, the, the drug binds to the myeloma cell, and then it just releases this little package of chemo into the cell, and that helps kill the myeloma cell, but there's also probably some other side effects, excuse me, uh, uh, anti-myeloma effects. Now, belantimab is kind of a, an interesting and a little bit of a drug that we don't understand. Well, I think that's the best way to say that. Oh, it only works about in one out of three patients, to be honest, if you give it by itself. Uh, there's lots of work trying to combine it with various drugs. That's a, a common theme in myeloma. And this is just a, a, a study on the right here where this was com the belantimab was combined with uh, pomalidomide and dexamethasone. So instead of 30% of patients responding, more than half did. So that's probably a good strategy. But the, but the really weird thing about belantimab is in the third of people that respond to it, they respond really well. Uh, and so we've certainly seen people who've been on this drug for several years. Um, and if you don't respond to it, we can figure that out right away, usually within a month. Now, Craig mentioned keratopathy, which is these corneal side effects, and he's absolutely right. If you stretch out the dosing, and we, we tend to dose people every month or six weeks, you can keep the benefits and minimize the eye toxicity. One of the best things that, that our patients really like about belantimab is it's given with no steroids, which is one of the few treatments that's like that. So people really, really, really like that. Um, let's go back to these CAR-Ts. So, so uh, Craig mentioned a little bit about this, but what's different between normal stuff and a CAR-T? So in your body normally, if you want your T cell to go kill something, it has to have a wingman. It has to have something that we call an antigen presenting cell. Somebody that says, hey, stupid, wake up. See this little thing? You should say, I don't like that. I want to go kill it. 
And so not only do they show it to the T cell, but they also kind of goose it a little bit with these little purple uh, spheres saying like, Vip! you know, you need to get going, go get that thing. But in a CAR T, what's done is to kind of remove that mechanism. So this T cell that's been engineered now recognizes this thing on its own and it comes in pre-turbocharged. So just like Craig said, they're administered basically without needing any help to go get that, uh, that target. Now, we have two CAR T's that are approved right now. So on the left is what's called a BECMA or Ida cell, uh, or Ida captagene veclusal, and on the right is Silta cell or Carvicti. Um, differences are there. So the one on the, the left here has one binding site for BCMA, which is a derived from a mouse. And this one has two binding sites for BCMA derived from a llama, of all things. Um, in any case, we know the, uh, Ida cell was the first one to publish data, and we know a couple of things. This is a little bit busy, but basically the more cells they can give you, the better it seems to work. We know that the response rate overall was around in the 80% range if you had uh, the highest dose, and the time that the response lasted was around uh, 11 months. Now, if you ended up getting a complete remission, you actually did much better than that, and now your response lasted a couple of years. Now, I'm gonna skip this uh, in the interest of time, but, it, but we know a couple of things about CAR-T responses. Now, we're getting a little bit smarter about this. Um, it isn't a home run in everybody, and so in this, in this analysis of who did really well with CAR-T, some of the people we would like to help, we didn't do as good with. So if you had high risk myeloma, if you had revised stage three myeloma, or you had a lot of myeloma in your bone marrow before you had a CAR T, you didn't do quite as good. You didn't hit that complete remission, meaning you didn't have control as long as you would like. Now, the, let's go to Silta cell. Silta cell right out of the bat had what appears to be a higher response rate. So I said about 80% at the highest level for Ida cell. Uh, this one has close to 95% uh, when it was first released and a very high percentage of people going into remission and having this minimal residual disease negative, a term I probably some people are familiar with, um, which I won't go into right now. And when this data was followed up recently, it looked even better, 98%, which people were pretty excited about, um, and a lot of those people going into remission. And then if you look at the duration of response, in other words, how long is it lasting? How long before you might need something else? It looked like more than, uh, or almost three quarters of the patients at two years didn't need any other treatment, which was really quite exciting. So this has raised the question is, is there really a difference between these two? And some patients have said, well, should I hold out for one over the other? And I think at least the recommendation I can give you on October 15th, 2022, if you're looking to get a CAR-T, you probably should get whatever you can get because that has been the biggest challenge right now. And I'm gonna get to that in a minute. One of the things I'm excited about, there are so many more of these products under development. So this is just a partial list of different types of CAR-Ts that are being developed. So again, if you are trying to find a CAR-T, I would certainly seek out one of, a, a trial if you can find one because these appear to be getting better and better at fighting myeloma. Um, one of the other things that just came out, this is an announcement that occurred about a month ago, is it might be better to do a CAR-T much earlier in your myeloma journey. In other words, if you've had a couple of types of treatment, now it may be that you wanna do a CAR-T right away. So this was just very, really no data, but just saying that the earlier use of CAR-T looked better than standard chemotherapy. We don't know any more information except what, I, what I'm showing you here, but we expect to know some details about this trial in the next, uh, uh, next few months. So what are the limitations about CAR-T? Well, one of the things that I think uh, we do know is it doesn't work in everybody. And um, I'm sure you've heard stories, Jenny, uh, um, uh, through HealthTree. Um, we know that there are some people who don't seem to have an effect at all, that, that within a couple of weeks of the CAR-T, they're not doing well. Um, the other thing that we know about CAR-T is opposed to people who get treated for lymphoma or leukemia, the, it's not curative. And so it's gonna be another great treatment, but it's not gonna be the thing that is going to end treatment forever, at least it does not look like that. It's really, ex whoopsie, it's really expensive. It's a, about a half million uh, per transplant. 
And there are some immunosuppressive and in infection risks that you have to think about as well. But really the big thing right now is access. And so uh, we cannot provide the number of people who would like to try CAR-T with a CAR-T. There just aren't enough. Uh, there are manufacturing issues that have come up, uh, not with quality, but really quantity. And so that has been a big, big limitation in offering CAR-T to as many people. And that's true at every center, large and small, throughout the country right now. Okay, let's look at some of the other available treatments. Selenexer that Craig mentioned. So I, I am also a Selenexer uh, fan, I have to say, because this is a drug that works differently than everything else. It helps sort of retain a good uh, cancer-fighting uh, enzymes in the cell to help, to help uh, uh, slow down the growth of myeloma. But it, it, you can't take too much of it, and I think that's really the secret. And you also can't take it by itself to have the best effect. And this is just a study done with Selenexer in combination with carfilzomib and dexamethasone. And uh, these are all people who had many, many types of treatment. So this is all reduction of their myeloma uh, protein. So it looks pretty good. About three quarters of people responded to this. And this also includes people who had failed CAR-T and other BCMA-targeted therapies. So this is something that I think uh, it may end up being adapted more often. OK, so let's talk about bispecific engagers. So this is a class of drugs not here yet, but probably very, very soon coming. So how these work is uh, basically sort of like, a, I, I sometimes say like a, 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 poor, a poor man's CAR T because you are still engaging an immune cell here and pulling it to a, a, a plasma cell to help kill it. And this again, most of these are targeting BCMA again, that protein that I mentioned. Probably the one that is closest to approval is a drug called teclistimab. Teclistimab is, it is given subcutaneously um, it can cause some side effects like other CAR-T products can with this cytokine release syndrome. And then it goes from these tiny doses up to what's a once a weekly dose. Um, it tends to be given with some steroids early on to prevent that cytokine release, but you can drop them out later on. And I think people are very excited because this slide is just to tell you that it was tested in people who had had many, many, many types of treatments already. Response rates look pretty good. So, so they are about 60 to 70 percent depending on the trial and many of those people are doing quite well with the drug so if you look at what what is whoopsie excuse me very exciting here what we call median duration of response that means that there are people on this drug that are still responding and haven't needed to change uh, there also is sort of a tantalizing possibility that this might be a drug that you can stop and start and don't have to take continuously we'll see if that turns out to be true and this is outpatient treatment then there is another one of these drugs in this class. This is called telketamab. This is a little farther away. This is probably maybe a couple of years out. Uh, this is another bispecific engager. So you know the drug binds that immune cell, brings it over to the myeloma cell. Very high response rates. Again, it can be used in people who have had these BCMA-targeted therapies and seems to be effective. Um, great response rates. Uh, again, this is another subcutaneous drug. Um, it has some very special side effects because the target of this drug is not just confined to myeloma cells. It is actually found uh, involving nail and hair production. So one of the things that can happen is people can get some nail side effects. Now, this is obviously not life-threatening, but annoying. And you can use things like Sally Hansen's hard as nails to try to uh, help with that. But that is, a, that is a, a side effect that's pretty common. There's also a drug called Sevastimab that is targeting another protein on myeloma called FCRH5. Uh, this drug is another bispecific, again, tested out in people who've had many, many treatments, also has pretty good response rates, about 60%. Now, you can say none of these that I've shown you are 100%, but it helps you sort of figure out if, you, if we think of myeloma treatment sometimes as a kind of chess game, where you've got to make a move and you've got to have several moves in your back pocket is what you're going to do next. I think these are all going to be very, very helpful in the future. This is a whole list of these drugs, a couple of I mentioned, but more that are on the way. And I think this is a strategy we're going to see a lot of in myeloma in the future. So let's talk a little bit about other drugs that are on the way. These are called cell mods. This is a really a mouthful, cerebellum E ligase modulator. 
So basically, you can think of these drugs as cousins of pomalidomide and lenalidomide. They are oral. They're given the same way that those drugs are given, usually three weeks out of four. And they've been tested in people who are resistant to both pomalidomide and lenalidomide. And just like what we always do in myeloma, it's been tested by itself and has about a 40% response rate when combined with steroids. But it's being combined with a whole lot of other drugs and looks pretty good. These trials using abiratamide uh, are open. They, they might be available to somebody who might be uh, thinking about this. There's also another cell mod drug called mesigdamide or mezi that looks even better perhaps than abiratamide. There is the expectation that abiratamide is going to be approved, I think, probably within a year, which would be great because, again, it's another a drug, it's oral, and it will be convenient and particularly helpful if, it, if it's, uh, you're the person who responds to it. I just want to mention venetoclax. So venetoclax is a drug that is FDA approved, but not in myeloma. So it's approved in chronic lymphocytic leukemia and lymphoma. But about 20% of myeloma people have in their myeloma cells what's called a translocation of 1114. And this means that they are potentially very responsive to this drug venetoclax, which is an oral medicine. This one's taken every day. But uh, a couple of years ago, people found out that in this subset of people using venetoclax with some steroids, there was about four out of 10 people who responded. But now what happens is that if we take one of our familiar drugs, daratumumab here, and combine it with venetoclax, that's a really good response rate, 90%. And this is in people who've had many other types of treatment. But again, it's only really right now at least looking like the people who have this 1114 translocation should consider this kind of combination. But this is something that you could consider getting now if you're in that situation. Then uh, really sort of out there, many people may have, how many people have had daratumumab or on daratumumab? Or isatuximab too? Okay, anybody resistant to that that they know of? Anybody the daratumumab isn't working yet or has stopped working? Okay, oh, okay. So this drug is very interesting, uh, Modacafus, which also has sort of a cool name, but this is an anti-CD38 antibody, but it's combined with an old drug, interfe alpha interferon, that is something that we used in the 80s to treat myeloma. But what we think we're gonna be able to do with this drug is actually sort of retarget CD38, but bring in a new person to the party, the alpha interferon, so this drug is being tested in people who've had lots of different treatments. Um, the response rate here by itself is only about four out of 10, but this drug is once a month IV, which would be pretty nice. And it's gonna be combined with daratumumab, uh, which seems sort of counterintuitive, but, but we think it's gonna help resensitize to daratumumab. And again, this was tested out in people who failed a lot of other treatments. So I think that is one to watch. Now, um, I don't want to say that we're all incompetent, which is the picture here, but one of the things about these new therapies that I told you about, we don't really know what the best order to put them in or what we tend to call sequence. So there have been sort of uh, rumors going around that perhaps if you've had belantimab or Blenrep, you shouldn't go on to get a CAR-T transplant, or maybe you should have a bispecific and then get a CAR-T. We just don't know yet. So we don't know what the best order of these drugs is the other thing is we don't know if it should be the same in every person. And as you know from Jenny's wonderful work here, there are a lot of differences between people with myeloma. Sometimes people are stable six months and sometimes they're stable six years. So I think we're gonna have to figure out how to work with all these drugs and make them make sense for, for every individual patient. And that's why you putting in your data to HealthTree is so important so that we can kind of use that and figure out just questions like this that we don't know. Okay, and just in conclusion, I, I hope that you uh, feel there are gonna be a ton of options for myeloma, even if a person has had many, many treatments. I would definitely recommend, if you are looking at your third or fourth relapse, trying to join a clinical trial is often a really good idea because that tends to give you access to new drugs that you otherwise can't get. And if it doesn't work, okay, it doesn't work. Typically, what a clinical trial is gonna ask you is more time. Um, and, and we know that, and unfortunately, that is, it's hard to get around that because often we're taking, looking at safety, but the payoff can be very, very great. Uh, having somebody reevaluate you at the time that you may relapse, I think it's very, very important. And then if you are considering CAR-T, you really need to have a, the person that's helping to treat you, have you think about that early on, because at least right now, those lists to get access are very long. 
So I'm going to stop, and thank you very much. I'm thank you my so head. much, Dr. Callender. You're We're welcome. Gonna, uh, go for a 15-minute break with our online audience. Oh. So I'll sign off to them now. We've got a little housekeeping here. Um, in the back of your home, right side, of the back of your home, of your home, the right side of your home is behind the agenda and the back of the bios. We, if you want, to, are interested in, in having help with your.
This is our first time with a, uh, trying this, and it's going to get just better and better all the time. Um, we're going to, as I said, we're going to do the Health Tree Cure Hub discussion at the beginning of the second session instead, uh, because I think this is really important. I didn't want to take time away from this. So uh, without much further ado, I hand it over to Jenny. Okay, well, I will just pass the microphone back, back and forth, but I wanted to start, because a lot of you mentioned uh, different types of therapies, and I think an important therapy to consider are just around clinical trials. So can we just have a discussion about clinical trials, the importance of trials, when to consider joining a trial, like do you even consider it at a smoldering stage or um, even something like that? I just kind of want to open it up to your opinions on trials, generally speaking. I just want to let you know, too, I participated recently in um, the CARTITUDE 4 study here at Huntsman. Um, I have, I cry when I think about it, so I can't think about it too hard, with doc, Dr. Saborov, who helped me get into that trial to do um, Siltacel. And um, it was a remarkable experience. I feel so fortunate to have had, had it done. It was an incredible place to have it done, and he just, was advocated for me so hard that um, I'm just so so grateful. So it can be um, it can be such an important tool for patients, regardless of the time that they considered doing it. So and sorry, we're Jerry right here. <laughs> this is I've actually never seen something like this before. <laughs> um, let's see. I'm going to leave the smoldering question to Craig. Um, <laughs> The, uh, so I think the most important thing to remember about clinical trials is that the progress that we've made to date is because of clinical trials, right? That's part of the movement, and that's one of the reasons that the myeloma therapies are evolving so quickly, is that not only do we have new drugs, but we have patients who are willing to be participants in moving those drugs forward, okay? So, so clinical trials is, is fundamental to moving the entire field forward, fundamental to offer you all new treatments. Um, as far as when uh, to, uh, to go on a clinical trial, I think that at every phase of the disease, it's important to consider clinical trials. Uh, we were uh, fortunate to be on the Griffin trial, which is uh, basically changing standard of care and induction therapy. Uh, we have clinical trials all the way through maintenance and relapse refractory disease. And at each step of the way, uh, we're providing opportunities for you guys uh, to be part of this progress. And, uh, and we're, we're making a lot of headway. Yeah, I would just say, like I, I said in my talk, particularly if you have myeloma that's come back, I think this is a very good time to think about a clinical trial. And some people, well, first of all, I think it's really important that you hear about it from your provider, you know, whether it's a physician or a nurse practitioner. But one of the things that really helps determine whether people join a clinical trial is it's explained to you well. I think that's very, very clear from the research that's done. Um, and I think also what I, a thing that I hear from patients sometimes is, well, I don't want to be a guinea pig. And, and I get that, but at the same time, I think people don't understand how carefully constructed these trials are. They go through many levels of inspection by outside parties to try to make sure that they're not just safe, but they're actually reasonable. In other words, that, that, that you will get a benefit potentially, or you often at least get standard of care. Now, just like Jenny described, that particular trial uh, was really something that was quite different than had been around. And uh, she was, you know, there are some trials where you're asked to have maybe just what's around and not the new thing. But, uh, but typically, they really can provide you access to uh, I interventions that you otherwise can't get. Okay. Um, I'm supposed to deal with smoldering. Uh, so the difference between me, Natalie, uh, well, just me and Natalie, beyond my fabulous hair, is <laughs> the fact that we are at different institutions that have different access to different trials, different things that are open at different times. We're all academic uh, myeloma docs, so we have many more similarities than we have differences. And when you see, when you're going to see a doc uh, for your myeloma, remember that you are 2% of all cancers. Your average 
Doc does not see myeloma professionally. They see five myeloma patients in a year. And that's because myeloma is 2% of all cancers. And so if you're seeing a myeloma professional, then what's different between us, while we love to say that we give Zometa differently or this and that, really the difference is that different institutions have different access to trials. And when you are talking with your doctor about trials, everyone should be able to say what they're getting out of it. And everyone should be pretty upfront about it. Patients are looking for a treatment that will help. The physician that you see is getting recognition, publication, uh, etc. The drug company is pushing a drug to get approved. Any number of things that are going on, you want to have all of that pretty upfront and transparent. And that goes as well to the mechanisms of the trial. What, are, what is required? Oh, this is a, we have trials at our institution for MGUS. We have trials at our institution for smoldering myeloma. Okay, what does this require? How many extra visits do I need to take? What, how are you gonna poke and prod me and what would normally happen if I wasn't poked and prodded? Uh, these are the things that help patients figure out the balance. What is the risks and benefits of heading towards this clinical trial? What am I getting out of it? And how much is it gonna cost me? And none of that is about money. It's all about, in general, different procedures, different responses, different treatments. So having a clear conversation with your doctor about what is available and then what makes the best sense. You're only going to get into a trial where ethically it's just as good as anything else you might get in at the time because that's how we created the trials. The trials were created such that we can't make those errors. Uh, but everything else about the trial is worth talking about and trying to make sure that you understand what you're getting out of it and what it's going to cost you in terms of additional procedures, visits, et cetera, is the type of information that should occur in the consent. And the consent is a disaster. In the vast majority of clinical trials, they are written by a regulatory person who's just reading over the protocol and putting in these tables that create a 64-page document of mush, uh, which is very difficult to get through. And in fact, most of my job is trying to break down for the patient exactly what is required and what they, what they should view to get out of it and what are the risks. And I think that if these consent forms were written better, we would be able to give patients a, a better picture of it. And there's no spot in my clinic and no patient I see where I don't think, hey, is there a clinical trial for this available? Is this a, a situation where this patient might, where the benefits outweigh the risks for clinical trial participation for this MGUS patient, the smoldering patient, the newly diagnosed patient, the transplant patient, et cetera, et cetera. So there's no spot where we're not trying to do it different or make it better. Okay, that's great. And <clears throat> I do want to just point out again that depending on the institution, the institution gets to, to, I mean, they get to kind of decide their strategy about their clinical trial strategy. Because like when I first came to Huntsman, there weren't really very few, if any, clinical trials being run here. And what I've noticed you do in the program is build up <clears throat> kind of a full suite of clinical trials for the newly diagnosed patient, for the, you know, for the smoldering myeloma patient, for the relapse refractory, or in different settings. And the three of you all have that. But not, that doesn't happen at every facility. So that's, the, I want to reiterate your point that, that at different institutions, um, there are different trials open. So you may not always have... Um, you, you know, your doctor may not always talk to you about the clinical trials that are open, but ask. Ask about the trials that are open. And if you learn about a trial that you want to join that might not be open at your facility, that's an option too. So, and your doctor can help you facilitate you joining a study if something's not open. So, anyway, just consider that. Like, for example, there's a trial called the ARIGA trial. It's, it's like a newly diagnosed, so how do you reach newly diagnosed patients who want to get maybe daratumumab as their maintenance therapy or something like that. You know, how do you, how do, you do that? You, you don't, um, it's hard for the newly diagnosed patient who's just 
totally blown away by the fact they have myeloma, actually, to think about joining a clinical trial, but you could get early access to things, um, potentially. So you need to kind of understand, how do the trials work? What are the arms? And anyway, thank you for your conversation about that. I kind of want to ask um, a kind of a thought-provoking question. Dr. Kellner, you talked about this a little bit, that we don't quite know what the sequencing looks like for, for this. But as I'm, I've, when I was diagnosed in 2010, I never, ever heard the word cure. If myeloma experts ever used the word cure, they were kind of mocked and um, that that was not going to ever be in the, in the pathway. I hear you as investigators talking about that as a potential. Maybe it's not for all patients. Maybe it's for a subset of lower risk patients or certain, maybe it's for 1114 patients or maybe it's, you know, what, but how do we get to that path? What are you seeing change in terms of the sequencing or the use? I mean, you talked about like bringing up um, CAR-T earlier in lines of therapy. Um, how do you do that with therapies that are immune system function, like if you're looking at transplant, you're looking at a bispecific, you're looking at CAR-T, <clears throat> all of that is utilizing the immune system. So you do burn it out at some point, or like when do you use it, when is it the strongest? Anyway, just kind of want to facilitate a discussion about how you think about it as myeloma experts. Let's start down there. You want me to start? <laughs> we can go, yeah. go backwards. Yeah. Crap. Uh, okay. <laughs> Just not, did not want this one. So the, the idea of cure, uh, when I think about cure, I am thinking about the patient where I said, don't come back uh, because you're done. You don't need to see a hematologist ever again. I'm done with you and hematology is done with you. That's my view of cure. Uh, and everything else is about risk and what you're going to, and what's going to happen in likelihoods. And it's more like my retirement planning than anything else. Like, oh, what is the chances that I'll reach this amount? You know, this is, that's one thing. I think in terms of how do we get closer to a cure, I think, again, having more patients being treated at academic centers like this so that less than, so that more than 2% of myeloma patients participate in clinical trials, uh, and so we get a diverse population of patients onto clinical trials. Uh, and in terms of sequencing, you know, I think that the, um, I think we are less, I am less worried about the sequencing of treatments damaging or changing the patient's innate immune system uh, than I am about uh, every treatment uh, affecting the patient's population of myeloma cells. Uh, in, for instance, CAR-T. You know, for uh, Ida cell patients, uh, this is the BMS CAR-T. We know that these, uh, these CAR-Ts often will die out uh, six months into it, and hence patients are basically without therapy at that point, and their myeloma is going to come back. We just don't know exactly when. And this situation is similar to Siltacel, but with some caveats. I'm less worried that I've irrevocably damaged their immune system. I'm more, more understanding about the fact that my little CAR-T warriors are gone, and they won't last forever. And that means that a bispecific is available at some point, whereas if we switch that, and somebody was continually getting a BCMA bispecific, a, an antibody targeted towards that protein, and then they became resistant to that, well, then I'd be very uninclined to use a BCMA CAR-T in that patient because they've already shown themselves to be resistant for expression on their cell surface of that BCMA. And I leave it to my colleagues to address some of the other tough issues. Well, I, I want to approach this by a little bit of a different uh, point of view. Um, I do transplants for different blood disorders, not just myeloma. I think you all do as well. Yes? So one of the things that's been very clear to me throughout my career is we know that if we send people with certain blood disorders like lymphoma and leukemia through, say, a transplant, a donor transplant, after a certain couple of years, pretty much not going to come back. 
Now that's not been true in myeloma, and, and that is even true with donor transplants for myeloma, which is one of the reasons that, that they sort of fell out. So I'm actually very interested in treatments that might restore equilibrium more than just say, you have to eradicate every last cell. And people talk about perhaps what we'd like to do is get everybody back to this sort of very early precursor, something that we call MGUS or monoclonal gammopathy, where you might have some plasma cells, some myeloma cells still around, but you've kind of sequestered them and your immune system is taking over and just sort of roping them off, if you will. And I think that may be in the long run a more realistic goal and might get us to a better place um, because anytime we hit hard and really try to reduce uh, myeloma cells, because of what they do normally in the body, those plasma cells, you are hitting hard on other important parts of the immune system. And, and, and I will be the first person to admit this is all quite complicated, but I think we really have to sort of include the idea that maybe you want to think about the normal systems in the body too and try to include them and get everybody more to a balance rather than annihilation. At least we always end with a bald guy. <laughs> Jeez, such a, this is such a hard question. Um, so I'm one of those people who's not using that C word yet. Um, I, I think that for the most part, we're stuck in this myeloma academics, clinical trialists, are stuck in this, um, well, let's just add more. Uh, so if three drugs was good, let's add another drug that we think is good. Okay, well, maybe that's better. And Craig showed that slide that, you know, with Griffin, you're looking at a progression-free survival of, you know, however long, much longer than anything we've seen. Well, maybe we should add another drug to that. Okay, well, then, you know, speaking to Jenny's point, then we start mucking up the system. We get further away from that homeostasis, that that equilibrium. And so I think that it really calls into, uh, it really highlights the importance of the work that's being done, not only in the clinic, but in the lab. And we need, we're working towards identifying what those myeloma stem cells look like, identifying different therapies that we can incorporate um, uh, into patients' treatment that are not just controlling the active clones that we have uh, or the active disease that we have, but really getting deeper and getting rid of these cells altogether. Um, and so I, I think that the, the work is being done. I think that we're inching closer to it, um, but I think that there's a lot of work that's left to do. Okay, last question, and Greg is flagging me down, so we have to be quick. How important is it uh, for myeloma patients to understand the type of myeloma that they have, genetically speaking, or what does that change um, in the way you practice myeloma care? Can I take your turn? Okay. Well, I th that's a, I'll try to be brief. Well, we do know that there are some people who look ahead of time like they're going to have a little bit of a harder time with their myeloma. Usually that means that at first treatment, they're going to respond probably just as well as anybody else, but they may have a relapse much more quickly. So we can identify some of those people, but honestly not all of those people. So I think it is good to know maybe where you fall in that spectrum. But the other thing I think is very important to know is how is your provider tracking your myeloma. You know, I mentioned some things in my talk. You have to realize that that can change over time, that sometimes you stop making protein or you only make light chains. The more that you're aware of what is being tracked, um, and people sometimes come to me and say, what's the one lab test I should look at? But it's not one lab test. It's sort of all of you. So are you anemic? Are your kidneys chugging along? You know, how about those protein levels? What's happening with your other antibody levels? So it is very good to be informed about all of that. You can mic drop it right there. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Well done. I'm just going to pick up the mic just for a second. Um, I think that um, expectations are very important um, and, and having an honest conversation about um, what we're looking at in the first year, the second year, you know, ongoing. And so understanding those features about the disease and having that very frank and honest discussion with your provider is really important uh, because, you know, you can go online and you can say, well, you know, uh, 
you know, Jim from Kentucky, uh, you know, at 10 years is, is still alive and he hasn't been on maintenance therapy for, you know, eight years, right? But then you could have very different disease. And so I think it's really important to understand that, that myeloma is heterogeneous. It's not just one type of disease and everybody's disease is going to act a little bit differently. And so I think that that's an important, uh, important key piece. Okay, and with that, um, I just wanted to have a little plug for Health Tree Cure Hub because this is what we can help you do in Health Tree Cure Hub is track some of that so it'll, f you know, help you flag like when you need to. We, we find this more in the general oncology setting than we, we don't find this in the academic center setting with myeloma specialists necessarily, but sometimes in the general oncology setting when you're going to a community provider, um, they may not be tracking as much as you do at the academic center, so you kind of need to take that on also yourself. I know it doesn't seem fair, but um, you do need to be aware of your own disease and uh, what, how it's trending. So you can catch things early and not wait for end organ damage. So thank you very much, very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So this is the part of the program uh, the reason we call these round tables, uh, it's, I want you to visualize not a round table discussion, one word, but the table, a nice round table like in King Arthur's Court. And this is where we're all equal here. We're all sitting at the front of the table. And uh, one of the reasons I pushed the session back is because Dr. Callender has to leave after lunch, so I didn't want to you know, take away any time from her. Um, and the other thing I like about these Q's and Q and A's that we do is, is this is a time for you, you know, you all, we all know they know a lot, we, but honestly, we really don't care about that. What we really care about is what do they think? Um, and that's what we're all about here. So this is going to be a little different. Uh, I'm going to ask the, uh, the speakers when a question is asked for our online audience, if you could repeat it in the mic because they won't hear it. Um, and just to, you know, like at the auctions, just give me a signal, you know, that you want to speak and I will sort of order you along and I hope you think of good questions. We're going to do this again in the afternoon and Dr. Hoffmeister will be there again and you can grill him with the hardest questions you want. <laughs> yeah, we so, the softballs right now, right? So who would like to begin? Ah, I'll just start right here, here, and here. Hi. Um, do you want the microphone? Please? No, no, and you, that's why you have to repeat the question. The question is, what happened over the course of therapy, and why did you go from a baseline weight to, to now gaining weight? And is it myeloma, or is it medication, or is it a combination of the two? So uh, my guess is that uh, you've seen quite a bit of our favorite friend, dexamethasone. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, you know, that's really uh, one of the most profound uh, issues with the dexamethasone. Um, there's, as all of you know, uh, or most of you know, uh, there are a lot of other problems associated with it, but that's the big one. And so my guess is that that's been the biggest culprit in, in you. Um, as far as metabolism, I can't necess necessarily speak to that, but I will say that the dexamethasone questions is, is a very interesting one, and I think that, at least in my practice, I've started moving away from the long-term high doses of dexamethasone. I think that it plays a role, especially at newly diagnosed, in the new, newly diagnosed setting or when the disease is particularly active. It also helps a lot with drug tolerability. So it definitely has uh, a, a prominent role in our therapies. But I think the long-term exposure to steroids, I think we're all realizing that it causes a lot of problems. And so we really have to walk that, that fine line of risks and benefits uh, in regard to dexamethasone exposure. You guys want to add something? Yeah, uh, so again, towards metabolism and what, cause, what can lead to weight gain, you know, as uh, Doug mentioned, steroids. So one of the other things they do besides tending to gain weight is they'll make your muscles weaker. So they make your, th your big muscles, as we call your thighs, your upper arms. So people get weaker, then they do less, then they're expending less energy. And you get into, unfortunately, a really vicious cycle sometimes where the less you do, the less you do. 
So just as Doug mentioned, I think we're all getting smarter about this to say using less steroids, but also really encouraging any kind of activity that you can do. If it's the couch pedal that you can do with those, um, do it. If it's small weights, do it. But really your friend here is physical activity. And I'm, I'm so pleased that you're emphasizing that in Health Tree because that's a big thing that we've been very lax on, I think, on the MD side in, in terms of, of promoting that. Right. Um, so BCMA was the you know first out of the gate, uh, but you'll see a lot of other targets coming up. You know, uh, on either this Wednesday or last Wednesday, New England Journal of Medicine uh, put in a some 19 patient uh, phase one of GPRC5D uh, CAR T cell. Uh, so that's a different target, um, and these these targets will just continue to you know, move on as we focus on different proteins on the cell surface of primarily plasma cells uh, that we can use therapeutically. We're also going to focus not only on the targets, the s things on the cell surface of the myeloma cell, but who's attacking the myeloma cell, which, which cell is involved. Are you giving it a T cell? Is it an NK cell? Is it a macrophage? You know, which parts of the immune system can you harness to attack? Uh, and you'll notice, you know, drugs like Blenrep uh, is uh, an antibody drug conjugate. So it's, tar it's targeted towards BCMA, but it brings a poison payload to the thing. So there, we're looking at different targets, different cells, and then uh, different mechanisms to try to kill myeloma cells. One thing about round tables as well, so these are basic one-room classrooms, uh, um, and so we have newly diagnosed first graders and really experienced 12th graders sitting in the same room. <laughs> so don't be afraid, oh, my question's not really that complicated because trust me, on our online audience, there are people who want to ask these questions. So, you know, ask anything you want and, and, and remember to please repeat the question. <laughs> So let's, let's talk a little bit about stem cell transplants. Um, stem cell transplants go back to the 1980s. And um, at that point, there was one drug only, melphalan. Well, I guess there's two. There was cyclophosphamide and maybe three because there was prednisone. So that was the case for 30 years. So nobody knew what to do. So the logic was, well, let's just use a whole lot of melphalan and we'll see if we can make people better. So this was done in a few, a handful of patients in the mid-1980s without stem cells and they said, boy, this kind of works, but people get really low blood counts. So that led to the whole idea, first of all, of giving bone marrow, which was what was done initially, and then more recently stem cells. So the, the way we do stem cell transplants, it's the number one reason a person has a transplant in the world. And it's been studied up and down and back and forth. So we still do it much the same way between our three institutions. I doubt there's a much variation. but. There's a sequence, so we first have to get stem cells out of you. That's done usually with a combination of drugs. Um, once that's done, they can be put in the freezer for a decade or more and used much later, or you can use them right away. Then I'm sure, except outside of a trial, we're all using the same old drug, melphalan. Some people split it in half, some people give it on one day, but we all use melphalan. You tend to get it and be asked to chew a mouthful of ice or popsicles that seems to this was thought up by a nurse, very effective. It seems to prevent uh, mouth sores. The melphalan is given, washes out in a day or two, then they infuse your cells through your vein. They're smart, they just go in the bone marrow and they start growing. So then there's a period of about, from the time the cells go in till new cells grow back, it's about 10 days or so before you start seeing the first kind of shoots, if you will, of cells coming out. Um, so I, I don't want to monopolize all this. Let me pass great. it. No, I can pass it. <laughs> 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 
but there are, there are very predictable side effects that happen. They, there are, uh, there's a, a, a diarrhea is very common, fatigue, loss of taste, loss of appetite. Um, there's a risk of infection. About seven out of 10 people have a fever. We all have our antibiotic cocktails that we do prophylactically. Uh, some centers put people in the hospital for all of this. Some people put it in for part, and some people put it in for none. Um, but whether you're doing it in uh, Utah or Georgia or Madison, Wisconsin, the recovery time, it's all about the same. Um, why don't you talk a little bit about what to expect out of the hospital once yeah. you recover? Absolutely. Um, so, as uh, Dr. Callender pointed out, these cells are, are is very predictable. So day 10, after you get the stem cells back, the light switch is starting to go on. I, I, I sort of explained it like a, an old car, right? You're starting to see, you're turning the key and you get a, you know, things are, are happening. Day 11, maybe the, the cars gives you a little bit of a turnover. And then day 12, generally, after the stem cells, the, the car wakes up, okay? And so at that point, you now are, those stem cells have made their way into the bones, have set up shop, and are starting to make normal cells again, okay? So you're starting to get, um, you're starting to get your immune system back. So in general, we have the GI toxicities that occur throughout the transplant process. Usually on day eight or nine, patients have our pitcher up on the wall and are throwing darts at it. Yeah, <laughs> but usually by day 11 or 12 and the, and the stem cells are waking up, patients start to feel a little bit better. Okay, so once your neutrophil count, which is a type of the white blood cell, once that it's above a certain level, then it's time if you're in the hospital, it's time to go home. Okay. In general, patients have to stay within a certain boundary uh, so to make sure that they're close. But in general, once we have discharged a patient, once they get past that day 12 or day 13, things are generally pretty safe. Okay. But there's long-acting toxicity or long-acting effects of that high dose of chemotherapy that we gave. And so it can take patients some time for that fatigue to go away. You know, we see taste changes. That can take a month or two to go away. So the system is sort of rebooting. One of the things to remember is that when you have your stem cells put back in, it takes them time to mature, right? So there's going to be risk for infection, not only just right after the transplant, but for months after, okay? So, you know, we ask patients to stay safe, to mask up, to make sure they're getting evusheld or you know they start their vaccines at the six month mark and so there's this this whole process that you have to go in uh, or go through over the course of the post transplant period to make sure that the system is is maturing and sort of rebooting normally um, i've had patients who have gone powder skiing uh, on day 18. okay <laughs> not that i said that they should go powder skiing <laughs> on day 18 but it was a big day and so you know they went some people will take months before that they can really, really get back to their normal activity. In general, what I, I tell patients is at the time of diagnosis is give me about six months. Okay, give me six months to get the disease under control, get you through the transplant period, and getting you to the point where you're starting to get, your, get back towards your baseline. At the one-year mark, my hope is that my patients are feeling better than they felt in a long time. Right? Because before we started the, the myeloma therapy, the myeloma has been active for a long period of time. Right? So that's sort of some of the things that we, we see in the post-transplant period. Um, every patient's different, but what's remarkable about the procedure is that on day 12 or 13, those, stel those stem cells have made it in and they set up shop. And, uh, and patients at that point are safe. Physical effects of it coming back, 
or will it just be another blood test that says my light chains are out of control? Yeah, Craig, do you want to take it? You want me to? No, go. Ahead. <coughs> Sorry, <laughs> well, first of all, we got a clap. Uh, you got the clap? <laughs> no, no, we didn't get the clap. We got a clap. Jeez. It's a tough crowd. I mean, you know, Madison's not, you know, that's a lot different than what happens here in Salt Lake City. A little frisky. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, uh, so basically the, the, the question is, is um, patient... Uh, receives Idacel uh, or a BECMA, which is a, a CAR T therapy. And uh, one of the advantages of being on a CAR T therapy is that, at least currently, we're not giving any therapy after. Okay? Um, and so uh, patients who have been heavily pretreated have this nice long period, uh, hopefully, a nice long period of not having to have treatment, which is a real treat um, for everybody. And the question really was well, how, how is this thing going to come back? Right? And so, how are we going to see it? Am I going to feel it? Uh, as a patient, am I going to feel symptoms, or is it going to be lab tests, or or whatever? So one of the, uh, I think the 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 most important point is that even though you have disease control, which is what it sounds like, you know, we have these numbers from the clinical trials that tell us, you know, a ballpark on average, this is about how long a patient's going to go uh, before their disease progresses again. And so as your, as your myeloma provider, we're saying, mm, okay, we're, we're thinking about that ballpark, understanding that's all on a bell curve, okay? And so you're looking at about, you know, 20 months if you've gotten a deep response from, from Ida cell. Okay, but that doesn't mean that we're not going to watch you until 20 months. We're going to continue watching you over the course uh, of your post-CAR T therapy. And it's very important to be monitoring for, you know, reconstitution of your immune system, right? Because we want you to stay safe in that space. But it's also very important that we're watching things like your light chains, right? Your, your, your M spike. You know, are there markers that are telling us that things might be waking up, okay? The, the really interesting question is, okay, well, let's say your disease starts waking up a little bit. Maybe your M spike goes down to nothing. And then all of a sudden you have a small M spike, it's 0.1. And we do a bone marrow biopsy and you've gone from being MRD negative or not having evidence of disease in your bone marrow and now you're MRD positive. How should we deal with that, right? And these are all questions that I will say that I don't think we have answers to at this point. But it's very, very important that you continue follow up after the CAR T procedure because every patient's gonna respond a little bit differently. I'd, I'd just like to add a, a couple of things to that. There is sort of some waves. What, what we have seen at our institution, the people who don't seem to get much improvement at all after CAR-T, and I'm talking about people just weeks to maybe a month or more, unfortunately those people are often in really bad situation. For people who've been controlled for a long time, we're, we're definitely seeing the ability to treat them again with other things, and that came out in the first trial that the survival of people who went through that original Abecma transplant trial, it was much, much longer than the response to the agent, to the CAR-T, meaning that once the CAR-T wears out, they still were able to go on and get different treatments. So I think that that's the expectation, particularly in people who go a long time. The, unfortunately, it, again, I don't know what you've seen, but the people who are, have very, very short responses or no response, I think those are really people that we are not helping very well. Well, I think, you know, I mentioned, oh, I'm sorry. So uh, BlendRep, the antibody drug conjugate, appears to have a lot of side effects. Uh, are there other drugs coming of that kind? Um, so a couple of comments. The, the, the uh, Belantamab, the antibody drug conjugate, 
has keratopathy, but that's about it. I mean, just, just to be very clear about it, it has a little bit of low platelets, but I, I think that's really the, the biggest problem. And, you know, as Craig was mentioning, dosing may take care of a lot of that, but there are other drugs coming. I mentioned that one, Modacafus, which is an antibody carrying interferon, but there are others coming. Craig, I wonder if you want because of your research. I honestly don't have other antibody drug conjugates that I'm looking forward to. You know, I, I think a lot of uh, patients uh, and their, predominantly their physicians need to closely follow, even for patients who are asymptomatic on Belenrep. And because you want somebody to look at the cornea and say, hey, is this cornea doing, is this cornea healthy, even though the patient sees well. Uh, so I think, uh, changing the, somewhat the dosing and watching closely with every dose to make sure the cornea is not effective can allow kind of maximum use of uh, Blenrep. And I don't have another antibody drug conjugate I'm really excited about. I'm going to give a shameless plug for some of the work that we're doing here <laughs> because I can. Um, so uh, Blenrep is obviously the first of its kind um, and, and it's can be very effective, as you pointed out, Kyle. Um, I think that, um, you know, this is an ADC that's directed against BCMA. And we have all these other BCMA drugs. And the question is, is can we construct an antibody drug conjugate that is targeting something else? You know, some other um, uh, antigen on the, on the myeloma cell. Uh, the answer is yes. Um, the question is, will it work? Another question is, is um, you know, the current antibody drug conjugate that we have, the, the chemo is conjugated to the, to the heavy chain. And so it's relatively limited as to how much chemotherapy you can deliver. And we're, we're constructing a new, uh, it's, it's basically a new way to deliver more chemotherapy on the ADC. Um, and uh, we're able to increase the chemo load by about 1,000. And we don't think that um, we don't think that's going to increase toxicity. So it's still very early, um, but I think that the concept of an antibody drug conjugate is brilliant, and I think that there's a lot of room there to grow uh, and uh, and try to uh, figure out how to optimize it. So the, the question was uh, essentially um, in randomized, uh, randomized clinical trials, there's, there's generally a 50% chance of getting standard of care um, and a 50% chance of getting standard of care plus. And, um, and so there's also other ways of, of getting at uh, uh, questions that may involve maybe retrospective data, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think the question was essentially, um, you know, is it, is it worth it for a patient to go on to a standard of care arm in a randomized perspective clinical trial? Is that, am I sort of hitting that? So um, I think that um, randomized phase three clinical trials are, um, are fundamental for us to answer the question of whether one regiment is better than the other. And I think that the, the one thing that does not happen in myeloma for the, in the vast, vast, almost 100% of the time is that you're not getting a placebo. And so our clinical trials in, include standard of care. It's a chance, absolutely. It's a chance, absolutely. But I think that without being part of that clinical trial, we're never going to have the answer to move things forward. And the thing about, you know, say, a newly diagnosed trial where you may have daratumumab or not, 
Well, we, we, we know that daratumumab is very, very effective at first progression, right? So you will be getting that drug at some point. And so, yes, you may be missing it at the beginning, but you will still have access to that drug at some point. And so I think it's a very difficult question. I think it's something that you as a patient, all of you patients, when you're thinking about these randomized trials is, you know, am I willing to do that, right? But from our perspective, it's, it's absolutely necessary that we have these high quality clinical trials that are looking at very valid endpoints to help us really answer the question of if one thing is better than the other. The, the one thing also I want to just make clear for everybody about trials, so there's different types of trials. A phase three trial is looking at a standard versus something new that usually has been tested, but there are phase two trials where people are offered often a new combination or a new drug where everybody is going to get the same thing. And we those phase two trials have usually been based on something that shows some good activity, as we call it. And then there are phase one trials, where you are being asked to take a brand new compound, typically, don't know if it's going to work or not. So in terms of risk, it's probably the phase ones that are the riskiest, because you could be taking a drug that is going to have no benefit whatsoever. Now, I can, I can Im imagine that every one of us here can tell you about patients that we've had on phase three trials getting the standard on where they actually do better. Um, they, they go into remission. So I don't think that in those trials that we really think you should worry about FOMO, that, that you are getting something that we think is good. There are examples out there in the myeloma world where our phase three trials have been negative. One of the big ones that came up recently in the past couple of years is there's a, a group of drugs that works great in things like lung cancer and kidney cancer and melanoma. These are checkpoint inhibitors, a drug called pembrolizumab, for example. Those were combined with standard drugs. Looked like a home run from the lab study, had a phase two trial, looked fantastic, caused excess death and, and morbidity in myeloma patients in phase three. So it's not always great. Um, now, I, you know, that shouldn't scare you away from a clinical trial, but I just want to say that um, there, are, there are times when the standard arm is good. I mean, so, uh, so I think that, that we do try to make it so it's fair, so you're not getting inferior treatment. You're getting what the experts here would say is really the standard. And one last comment <clears throat> is that the randomized, trial, randomized clinical trials are touchy. Right? They're very uncomfortable for the doctor if it's blinded and the patient all the time because it's upsetting that somebody else is deciding who, what treatment you're getting. And losing that control is upsetting. However it turns out, remember, is that the vast majority of myeloma patients who get treated in academic centers live longer. And partly that's because of the specialization the physician has, and also because of being able to participate in clinical trials. So in the, this has been published in myeloma, it's been published in leukemia, this, you're still part of, in essence, the winning team, even if that arm on that particular trial may or may not work out in the end, we won't know, you know, but in the, in the big, the, that small battle you may win or lose, but the overall war is al already won uh, through the treatment you're receiving. I have, I have one other comment. Sorry. I always prefer YOLO <laughs> rather than FOMO. <laughs> YOLO is you only live once. <laughs> FOMO is fear of missing out. So we'll go YOLO. <clears throat>
Sure. So, so the question is about uh, a, a cutaneous, a skin reaction to Velcade that is uh, very severe and lasting almost a week so that by the time you're getting another injection of Velcade, it's back again. Uh, there are definitely people who experience that. Uh, I think early on, now you may or may not know the reason we give Velcade like that is it used to be given intravenously and caused terribly high rates of neuropathy that way. So we've moved away from it. But there are people who have those reactions. Now, it's, I think it's kind of controversial how you handle that. Some people have said, well, ice it. And then people have said, well, maybe that's going to limit the distribution of Velcade throughout the body. There, the alternative that sometimes is proposed is to just go to the different drug carfilzomib, which you could potentially do. And then you shouldn't have the reaction, because that is given intravenously and it doesn't have neuropathy. Um, I, I, I have noticed in our clinic, sometimes it depends on who's administrating the Velcade, whether or not they get that reaction um, and the depth that it's given. Um, sometimes I have patients who then say, I want, you know, I want Jackie to give me my Velcade. I don't want Ed to give me my Velcade. So um, we've seen a little bit of that. I think apart from that, I'm not sure I know of a real an antidote. The only thing we've seen is that if you get, inject the Velcade like it's insulin, that's in general, you know, at an angle from the area, that's usually a bad idea. And you usually want to go perpendicular. And it, if you go a little deeper, usually you don't have these problems. Yes, that is actually what last time, what they did do, they changed the, dire the direction and the way they did it, and it did still do the same thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, it's uh, CAR-T questions, uh, car CAR-T-alusa. So number one is, uh, is BCMA expression required? You, you, do you test it beforehand? Number two is how much does the, um, the conditioning regimen, the fludarabine, cytoxin, or whatever, uh, manifest? And now that I said it, I just forgot the third one. Uh, but the first Oh, yes, and we, how to deal with too few CAR T cells, uh, and does that decrease uh, effic the effectiveness of the infusion? So number one, uh, BCMA is on the vast majority of myeloma cells, you can, and testing for it usually is not terribly helpful, uh, except for people who've progressed on another BCMA-directed therapy. Uh, the problem is that just because you have or don't have BCMA, your CAR T may or may not work because the myeloma cells can sometimes uh, create a protective cocoon even if they express the target. Uh, number two, fludarabine and cyclophosphamide uh, and a number of alternatives have very little anti-myeloma uh, efficacy. And there's some early data, but it's not great, that the more uh, immunosuppression and the more higher the intensity of that lymphodepleting chemotherapy, the more the CAR T's have an ability to expand. But it's really hard to research that as the pharmacokinetics of the drugs are very challenging. And number three is, what if you have too few CAR T cells that are viable and ready to go to the patient? Wouldn't that be better than nothing? And on average, the efficacy of these CAR T cells 
uh, it depends on the dose. And if, it's, if you only have 10% viability, well, it's going to be a waste of time. If you, have nine, if you wanted 100% viability and you have 97% viability, yeah, go ahead and do it. Uh, my patient who's out of spec on Carvicti coming up, has, you know, the viability is just 3% below their, their target. And uh, both the data from the company and independent data would suggest it's still going to be efficacious. Well, that's, that's an excellent question. So what about availability of clinical trials in rural America? And, and that is something that personally uh, I think that, that I've been trying to work on uh, with some of our cooperative groups because what's limiting us are federal rules here. Um, and uh, they will require, for example, that drug has to be administered at the, the clinical trial site, that blood work has to be done at the clinical trial site. There is movement to try to change that and make, you know, now we're doing telemedicine, right, with uh, COVID, to try to make that, to, to listen to that kind of problem. But there is a lot of, right now, red tape to get through. Part of it is for a good reason. So they'll say, how do we know that if we send our very precious experimental drug to other than the clinical research site, that you're going to take good care of it, that you're going to store it, that you're going to protect it? That's a valid question. I mean, that, that and, um, uh, but I think that there are people who are very interested in this who are going to try to loosen up some of these restrictions, like it doesn't matter if you get a CBC here in Salt Lake City or you get it in Provo, right? It's going to be the same result. So when we're looking at maybe testing that doesn't need to be done right at the clinical trial site, I think we're wide open and ready to, to make that move. But it's been tough to get some of our um, regulation uh, department, you know, either both in our institutions, but also on a national level through the National Cancer Institute to get them to try to make more reasonable accommodations for this issue. I can tell you a story about this guy who was in Columbus, Ohio, uh, that likes to go skiing and, uh, and, and realized that there is a, a pocket of the United States that doesn't, has not had access to high quality clinical trials. And that individual came to Salt Lake City and said, well, maybe there's an opportunity here for, for that. And that's me. So <laughs> I, I think that, and the point I'm making is, is not to uh, inflate myself, but to say that um, there's more opportunity that's happening uh, throughout uh, America, okay? So um, we have a nine-state catchment area. And so one of the things that, you know, really one of the fundamental things that this program does is, is has a clinical trial portfolio to offer patients in this region. And so we've said to, to drug companies uh, that are not cooperative group trials, but drug companies to say, well, listen, I'd love to run your trial, However, you're going to have to pay for my patients to travel down here and stay locally uh, so that they can get these drugs. And we've actually been able to, to set up those budgets. And, and these companies have actually been very open to that, right? Because, you know, especially people in this region have not had access. The other thing I would say is that there's, um, with, with programs like ours uh, in Colorado, et cetera, et cetera, there's, there's more of us interested in providing these services and these trials to, to our patients. And, and companies, cooperative groups, all of these different mechanisms for clinical trials have been open to including us uh, in those opportunities. And so uh, we've been able to offer things that really haven't, you know, 10 years ago were not possible in this region. And so that's happening across the United States and it's really a positive, a positive change. And I have a few online questions because we have, I'll take that from you. Yeah, we will. You don't have to repeat it. Uh, take this thing off. Um, wait, I had the question. Oh, here it is. Um, at what point in treatment, oh, no, that wasn't, the, oh, why do people relapse early from transplant and what options do they have? Early relapse myeloma occurs in up to about 20% of patients. 
um, that we weren't expecting to have an early relapse. Um, it's, a, it's a marker of a very high risk, um, very high risk disease. Um, I will tell you that um, as, as all of us have a lot of these patients, uh, we don't really know what to do. Um, and so in general, we try to be more aggressive and we try to, to utilize uh, what we call novel therapies or uh, novel approaches. Um, in some patients, we consider a quad therapy at the time of the first relapse after an early, uh, early progression after transplant. Um, some of these patients are able to go on clinical trial with CAR-Ts, et cetera. Um, but this is, a, this is a space of active investigation, and I will say that um, uh, we don't know what to be doing. Yeah, so um, I think that we're pinning down the, the, that definition now, um, but 18 months from the time of diagnosis in somebody who's not transplanted, um, three years uh, in somebody who has, uh, who's been on maintenance therapy after transplant, uh, and two years uh, or 18 months, 18 or 24 months after transplant if they're not on maintenance therapy. And this is a question really for newbies, uh, but it's really important, and it's a question that is asked literally at every roundtable that we have. Along with current therapies, is it acceptable to take natural herbs and vitamin supplements? And Dr. Hoffmeister uh, referred to that a little bit, but if you could expound on that a little bit. Uh, you want me to go over here since I've picked on you? You love that question. <laughs> I, I do love this question. Um, so the, just in case you've read about it, there's a bunch of posts and some published data about the use of vitamin C uh, with bortezomib saying, oh, you can't take vitamin C with bortezomib. And it should be better labeled, you can't take extraordinary amounts of vitamin C every two hours, 24-7, while on Velcade. Since nobody's doing that, I don't think it's a big concern. Uh, and the same goes for a uh, component of uh, green tea that, again, passionate green tea drinkers are out there somewhere and they tend to come to my clinic and are upset that somebody's published that they can't drink green tea anymore. And we all feel a lot better when they are able to drink green tea. Um, beyond that, uh, the uh, it's reasonable to, to remember that there's a, a number of drug-drug interactions uh, that, are imp that are clinically relevant that can occur from a variety of supplements that are not spelled out to the vast majority of us who aren't pharmacists. And unless you're a pharmacist, you may not be aware of all these relevant drug interactions. Uh, the supplement industry is thought as dietary aids, so they don't have any of the regulations and there are no restrictions on cost. And there's absolutely no compunction about advertising that it will boost your immune system. Every ad uh, f in, is, talks about boosting the immune system. And let me assure you, we know nothing about how to boost the immune system in a human. We're not bad at boosting the immune system in inbred mice. We're actually pretty good at that. But since none of you are inbred mice, it's not going to work out. So please do not spend lots of money getting stem cells or uh, strange supplements uh, to boost your immune system. That is not going to work. I'm just going to say a couple of things. I can't support that more, but two things, you know, I come, sometimes I have patients coming in saying, you know, this, uh, somebody told me about this, you know, this is really going to be a cure for this, isn't it? And I, and I, keep, I, I always tell patients, you know, this is America. If somebody really had the cure, boy, they would be marketing it and they would be obviously bazillionaires. So I think, you know, that kind of conspiracy theory, I would very much try to, try to get away from. But secondly, I, uh, I, I do underscore what Craig said. A patient came in recently and told me that they were going to an outside clinic where they were getting chemo, but they were also getting supplements given IV, and they were asked to pay $4,000 a week for those supplements. Again, not FDA approved, no data, but that this particular family was actually scraping together money to pay for it. And, and I really, really think that's a bad use of money. Better off to go powder skiing, I guess. I, I would say. <laughs>
It's always the right answer. <laughs> And we have many good online questions, and one particular on maintenance that I'm going to save for this afternoon, since Dr. Manny will be talking about that. Uh, and we have reached our lunch time, um, and so I'd like to say, uh, first of all, before we say goodbye to our online audience for an hour, um, you can. S I was really excited about this morning because I know these three speakers really well by their, either personally or by their reputation and having seen them speak many times. And it kind of worked out like I hoped it would. Uh, so I want to thank you so much for being here. <laughs> Dr. Callender uh, came from an important meeting on bone marrow transplant yesterday in Washington, D.C. So she got here late last night. I picked her up and she went right to bed and she's got to go home uh, after lunch. So that's one of the reasons. The Some <laughs> I'm glad you said that and not me. <laughs> but I also want to have sincerely thank Dr. Callender for making such an effort to be here for you today. And with that, I want to say goodbye to our online audience. And I just got one more thing to pitch before we go to lunch. Uh, and I've only got two of these left. This is a personal thing I'm doing. This has nothing to do with our foundation. Uh, one of my good friends is Arto Jurczycin from Poland, who we all know very well. Uh, and prior to the pandemic, he sent me these books uh, that he hoped we could distribute. And they're, it, it's uh, stories of multiple myeloma patients in celebration of the 100th anniversary of Poland's independence. And it's in English. So if you have any Polish ethnicity, think about this. They're $20 uh, and every penny goes to support myeloma research in Krakow, Poland. Uh, so if anybody would like these, come see me. I got two left, they're $20 each. Uh, uh, Artur and I always meet at the American Society of Hematology every, well, we haven't lately, but the last time we did, we, you know, was, I was telling my friends, it was like we were doing a drug deal when I was giving his money for the <laughs> books that he was selling. So, uh, <laughs> so if somebody looked at it the wrong way, they wouldn't know what was going on, but it was about these books. So thank you so much, and these will be uh, out front, and if you would like them, they'll be for sale. I really don't want to take them home. Uh, thank you so much, and have, we have lunch outside. Uh, I am, uh, we have an hour for lunch. I'm going to start yelling at you at about 10 minutes before, just so you can get ready, and then I'm really going to get nasty with three minutes left. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This was great. I asked.
Check, check, one, two. Testing, testing. All right, we're good to go. Are we good, Leo? <coughs> yeah, I'll go sit over there. Oh, wait, I forgot my question. Wait, oh, no, wait, just uh, email them. <laughs> That's right. Okay, well, welcome to our afternoon session. <coughs> we hope you enjoyed your lunch. And I just want to take a minute to say thank you to the sponsors who made this possible. Of course, you've seen the tables outside, and um, hopefully you've had a chance to talk to them about different things. But Amgen Oncology, GSK, Carrier Farm, Therapeutics, Bristol-Myers Squibb, Janssen Oncology, Legend Biotech, Santa Fe, Takeda Oncology, and Genentech have all s helped us so that we can run a program like this. And like Greg said, um, we this year we will have run eight of these round tables. Obviously, we've been going back live to live meetings just because I think it's so important for you to have that interaction with the myeloma specialists. And I just love the panels. The panel, that's my favorite part of the day. So I'm glad we have two of those with the experts. And I'll turn it back over to Greg. Thank you. One of the... Uh When I first met Jenny, the myeloma crowd was one person, and that was Jenny Alstrom. Um, and I volunteered a little bit, and I was sort of the second person. And then for the first couple of years, it was basically three or four people. So it's really been remarkable to see the growth of this organization over the years, and, and I've had a real good seat to watch it all. And one of the things I always talk about in our staff meetings is I wish people could see behind the curtain of what we do because when you look behind the curtain of our programs, it's even more impressive, and that's what this program, and that's what this little segment is about. Um, with health, a lot of talk to you about how it benefits you as a patient, and we've done a number of talks like that in the past. Um, this time I wanna focus on how you can help researchers by using Health Tree Cure Hub. Um, I, those of you who write, read my brilliant articles on our website, uh, you know that I'm working on a series now called The Revolution Around the Corner. Uh, and the most recent one that was published is about cost savings and revolution around the corner. And the revolution around the corner to me is that I think Health Tree, 10 years from now, will literally change the face of the world of medical research and treatment. Uh, I think we are on the, on the cusp of something really, really big. And I want you to understand why uh, I believe that and why we all have that. And these three gentlemen here are a major, important part of that. Um, so I'm going to start, uh, I'll introduce first, we have Todd Foster, who's the head of uh, Health Tree Cure Hub. Uh, you're the head of, pro I don't know anybody's title, I'll be honest with you. You're the head of product, okay? He's the head honcho. Uh, Nathan is, we have two PhDs on staff. You know, I, I can think of no other organizations like ours that have PhDs on staff that, that help run research. So here we have Nathan Sweeney and Jay Hydron. Jay's relatively new, I just remembered his last name. <laughs> but I'd like to start, uh, we normally just save Q&A for the, the questions, but I, I want to ask one question of each of them, and then we should have about five or six minutes left, and if you have any questions, please ask them, and then we'll go to Dr. Manny after that. So, first of all, let me, oh gosh, my phone. Uh, Todd, what do you do uh, to make Health Tree Cure Hub more effective for researchers? All right, so, so with Health Tree Cure Hub, well, first of all, Health Tree, and the myeloma crowd when it first started has built an amazing community of people and when we started building cure hub i don't know we weren't sure what the reception would be for a system where you share your medical records um, we like to say you share your stories with us and so we built it and you know it's been around three almost four years and we have about 11,000 patients in the system 11,000 multiple myeloma patients in the system so I think the trust that was built has helped that, but there's a, there's a lot of patients sharing their stories with us. And, you know, we call it Cure Hub because it is a hub of all of these patients' data coming into one place. And uh, many cancer patients go to more than one place, you know, for, for treatments and everything that's going on in their lives, and we're able to pull that into one system and have all that data there. And then... Um, 
I don't want to upset Dr. Sboroff, but you know, we did put Cure in there. <laughs> it, <laughs> it is a hub where we hope that we can find a cure um, to this disease, and, and that takes all of you sharing your story. Um, so that's, that's my answer. Thank you. <laughs> that gives you a good sense. And uh, the next question is for Jay, and I'll, I'll, so how might Cure Hub change the way clinical trials are conducted in the future? Well, it, it truly is a wonderful question to ask because clinical trials require a lot of resources. And to get enough patients into a data set with some really important endpoints is a huge challenge and takes a lot of really well-trained researchers to do that. But in Health Tree Cure Hub, we have your story. We can label your data. We know that a drug you take is related to your induction therapy, your consolidation, your maintenance, your second uh, treatment. And then we can quickly, in an afternoon, identify a cohort uh, and, and look at them and see how they're doing. And then know for you as a patient and your story, if there's other people like you and how they did on those treatments. And we right now we can't, but we're really seeing a pathway where if you tell us your story and who you are, there might be a, a clinical trial in our data set um, that's very, very similar to who you are and could help you in your treatment decision. Um, we're reproducing clinical trials with their data set right now uh, with very similar sample sizes to what the clinical trials are. This morning you saw Clinical trials between 100 and 200 people, we're redoing one where we're going to be pretty close to that. We have in the control arm a twin match with 120 patients. Um, so to have a really strong control arm is fantastic. And more important in our control arms, we have all comers. We have people with kidney issues. We have people with disease levels where a clinical trial might not be able to accept you. But in our data, we have that. So we can say, oh, they're a risk, high risk patient for these other reasons, and they're included in our data set. So in some ways, we will never be able to replace a clinical trial. But in other ways, we can fill gaps and answer your questions so you can make the best decision for you and um, moving forward in, in your life and how you want um, that relationship to be with your doctor and your family. So we're really excited uh, to provide that to you and uh, give you the answers that are really difficult to ask sometimes. So hopefully that answers some of the, that question. <laughs> I saved the best question for last and the most difficult question, uh, and that's why I gave it to Nathan. Uh, so, so explain to us, uh, Nathan, what Jay and Todd just described, uh, how does that translate into time and cost savings and prog more importantly, progress for the myeloma community? <clears throat> That's easy. <laughs> um, so we've worked with a number of doctors and investigators. All of them have been outstanding and we look forward to working with them again. Um, each of them have remarked how much faster their research has gone when using Health Tree Cure Hub. And so one example, two examples, um, <clears throat> we did this one study with Dr. Jens Hillengas. He's a great doctor at Roswell Park in Buffalo, New York. Um, he came from Germany. Um, no offense to any Germans. That's what makes him great. <laughs> <laughs> so it makes him great, that's true. And um, so he conducted this study originally in Germany. It took him approximately three years. They got 600 patients to participate. It was a great success. And so when he came here to the United States, he wanted to recreate that. So he, it's identical uh, study. Um, the only difference was that it was facilitated by a Health Tree Cure Hub. And we had 600 plus uh, participants in three months. So we took three years and consolidated it into three months and we gave him the results and he published it. And so that was just light years faster. Um, another study that we did was with Manny. And um, if you haven't had a chance to uh, meet or, or talk to Manny, he's, he's, in my opinion, awesome. He's, <laughs> he's just this firecracker, just anxious to do uh, um, research and, and, 
and move the field forward. And um, so he came with us with a, a study in collaboration with Dr. Sabrov as well. And <clears throat> we, many of you probably participated in the study, but um, I don't know what they were expecting, but we ended up getting over 1,500 patients to participate in this study. And that snowballed into an abstract that was published to a national conference. Um, it got accepted as a manuscript to a national journal. Um, so it was, and all of this was done in six months? Actually less. Less, less than six months. So it was, again, just we're able to speed up the process. And when we can do that, we can save money. And so <clears throat> we don't charge academia a dime. So in that regard, we're, we're saving hundreds of thousands, if not millions, depending on the, the, the breadth of the study. And we're saving um, just time. And hopefully that, that translates into saving lives. So we have, time for, we have time for one or two questions. And I sure hope you have one or two questions. Otherwise, we will move along to Dr. Manny. Uh, does anybody have any questions about clinical trials? Yes, I can. Oh, I'm dropping stuff. I'm just going to give you this so we get it for the recording. So, so my question is around the, the, the database. So access to the database, is that primary academia that does, has access to the database, or is that expanded beyond that? Now get this. Who wants to take that one? That's a real fun one. I think all the screens look good. I think that's probably the, the most important question to ask today is who has access to it? And right now, only us, only Health Tree Cure Hub uh, personnel have access. What we do is we, um, and when I bring data in, I just see DNA identified data, and I just see the, the uh, outcome variables and descriptive variables of interest to that study. So we want to protect who you are, your medical records, um, and and Todd should answer a little bit more of the technical aspect behind that. But from a research aspect, uh, it's all de-identified, then we control um, all the reports that come out of that too, so that we can make sure that they're of high quality and there's no, all the bias is removed from it and, and you're, the answer is truly the answer that the data is giving us. Um, and then Todd, do you want to talk about the technical part? <laughs> the technical part. Um, yeah, so your personal information is never shared without your knowledge. Um, if, if there were a need for that, we would reach out and get your permission first. Um, and if you did not give permission, it would not be shared. So we, ch we consider it your data, not our data, and that you can have done what you want with your data. And it is, you know, it's in, a, it's in a database that uses all the latest technology to keep it safe from hackers and people that try to break in, it, update it almost on a daily basis with the latest and greatest patches and, and all that to keep it safe and as secure as, as what's available today to do that, so. Um, so there was a re recently the NIH did a webinar on rare diseases and to get new drug targets for rare diseases is a huge issue um, because you have to get the biological samples so you have the cells so you can find what proteins on them might respond to the future drug. In rare diseases, uh, institutes just don't have the numbers to run that data. But with Health Tree Cure Hub, what we can do is uh, look at where people are getting treatment. They may or may not have samples there. We don't know. Uh, but then we can reach out to you and say, hey, if this um, university is interested in this drug target and identifying it, would it be okay if they reached out to you and then to, the, uh, to uh, your treatment center and see if there's a slide available? And why the NIH is really interested in this is because as a patient advocacy group, we can have where those samples might be compiled in one place. And then over a course of a month or two, we can identify if that um, study design is feasible or not. And then um, the universities uh, and academic centers can coordinate amongst themselves to share samples. And this happens across all rare, rare diseases. Um, so we play, we can play a really big role in that. And then, of course, we would ask you your permission and involvement in that study. With that, 
I want to thank all three of you. And as you get up, if you could bring the chairs over to the corner, it'd be fabulous. <laughs> uh, and I wanted you, you know, there's, there's a, one of the things that I've always worried about in these kind of meetings is I don't want to toot, this, these meetings are about you, not us, uh, quite honestly. Uh, so I, I'm always wary about tooting our own horn. Uh, and this is more, I really wanted, to, these are three people you rarely will have personal contact with. And they have an incredible impact on your futures. Uh, and I wanted you to see how we do that. And with that, um, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, um, uh, Dr. Manny. Is it Moyudin? Mo Moyudin. Moyudin. Okay, I can get at that. Um, I do not know him personally, but I have been eavesdropping on him on YouTube and other things. Uh, so that's why I felt comfortable having asked to ask him to speak here today. Um, and he's going to look into some other issues, uh, as you see. Uh, uh, he's going to have a little different perspectives of things and, 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 and illuminate some things. So with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Manny Moyudin. And, and also one thing, I used to take out the curls. That was my hair when I was in college. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Are my slides oh. here? I, did you send them to me? I did. If you, or I don't know if you pull up my email. Hey, Greg, mine too. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's mine. That's me. Yep. That's me. Okay, let me download these really quick. Oh, I already downloaded them. Perfect. So, uh, my name is Mani Moyudin. I'm probably the most junior myeloma doctor here. So, take what I say with a grain of salt. Um, but uh, I'm very happy to be here and um, perfect. All right. So, okay, perfect. Can you, can you all hear me better? Okay, perfect. So um, I finished fellowship last year. So for the last year and a half, I've been uh, focusing on multiple myeloma and other plasma cell disorders. Um, I've had the fortune of working with Health Tree Cure Hub on, on some projects. I'll briefly touch upon them. The topic that I'm gonna talk about today is maintenance in myeloma. And um, I'm gonna sort of go over the history of maintenance, the landscape of maintenance today, and how maintenance trials um, look like in the future. And then I'm also going to use those trials as examples of some of the, the issues that we face in myeloma on trials, control arms, endpoints, and you know, what's the best solution moving forward. Um, and also about individualizing care, which is you know, something that you know, for most of how we've treated myeloma, it's been a one-size-fits-all approach and how that may not be the best way to treat myeloma for everybody. All right, so we'll jump in. Um, so rational history, what do we use, side effects, how long should maintenance be, and, and future directions. So, you know, we've been trying maintenance uh, in myeloma for a long, long time, and this goes back from where you know, we didn't have a lot of good options, so we tried prednisone, we tried interferon, we tried thalidomide, and the thing about these trials is that these drugs were toxic, they impaired quality of life, and they never convincingly led people to, to live longer, right? Ultimately, when we're doing maintenance, right, so we do maintenance after we've done some sort of intensive induction therapy for, uh, you know, three to four months, and then we've done a transplant, and then you've recovered from the transplant, and now we're doing something to try to keep the disease under control, right? So we're subjecting you all to additional therapy and it should be worth it, right? You're still having to take a pill after having gone through transplant and induction. It should be worth it, it should help you live longer, right? So these old agents did not lead to improved longevity and they were toxic. So these trials didn't really work out. Revlimid maintenance, however, did work out. So there have been multiple large randomized trials where the use of Revlimid not only prolonged the remission, but it helped people live longer. And we're talking in excess of two years um, on average if you sort of pool the analysis of those trials. Now, some of those trials had less of an OS, less of a survival benefit, some had more. But if you pool the data, at least from that era, it is very convincing that Revlimid maintenance compared to no maintenance, and you can sort of see that in the, 
in the blue graph versus the, the yellow graph. You know, the blue graph is doing a whole lot better. And um, this sort of was the backbone that established maintenance therapy in principle. Meaning, and, and you know, this was from a time where the induction therapies that we used were a little different, right? So these trials are now, you know, over a decade old. So at that time, the induction therapy was not what, you know, what our patients are getting today. So today our patients are getting three drugs or four drugs. A lot of the induction therapy used at this time was two drugs, sometimes three drugs. And a lot of people had residual disease, right? The, they didn't, the disease wasn't cleared by these two or sometimes three drug regimens. And so maintenance therapy was better than not doing anything after some residual disease was left behind. So the induction therapy doesn't really compare to today's standards. Um, and hence, you know, the question of how much benefit maintenance adds with today's modern therapy for people who've had really, really good responses already with, you know, induction and transplant is an open one. And I think it, it should be investigated. Then the question comes and, you know, there's almost a cultural divide on how much Revlimid is enough, right? Like Revlimid for two years or Revlimid for one year or Revlimid lifelong. And I think uh, across the ocean in Europe, generally, you know, there's more of a finite use of Revlimid, whereas in the US, we tend to give Revlimid until either progression or until there's some intolerance and patients can't take Revlimid anymore. Now, do we have strong data that sort of backs this? And I would say that there is a randomized trial that's completed enrollment and, you know, we'll, we'll have answers, but our data is sort of based on, you know, weak data, I would argue. So if you look at this trial, and you know, this is a trial in which you know, we, we're, we're comparing people who continued Revlimid versus people who stopped Revlimid. People weren't randomized to either continue Revlimid or stop Revlimid. We're sort of looking back and seeing those who continued versus those who stopped. It sure seems that those who continued seem to have, a, have prolonged uh, PFS or their disease stayed in remission for longer. Now we always take these sort of analyses with a grain of salt, right? Because the people who are able to continue treatment usually have different characteristics, biological features, uh, socioeconomic status compared to those who don't. Um, so this was a follow-up of a randomized trial, but this wasn't the actual randomization, but it's the best we have. So a lot of us, um, you know, if somebody's tolerating Revlimid really well, otherwise they're not having issues, it's not affecting their quality of life, at least in the United States, a lot of us tend to continue Revlimid. The question of, you know, should, can you stop early for those who respond really well is an open one, which I'll sort of talk about a little in, in a little bit. So we've had an explosion of new drugs in myeloma, right? And a lot of these drugs, as you all know, or as you all might know, the you know, new drugs are, are first studied in the relapse refractory space, right? For patients who've had multiple relapses, that's where these drugs first get studied. And then they get brought forward. And then, you know, maintenance is one place where we can look at as well and see if, you know, if, you, if adding something to Revlimid helps. So we do have data from two randomized trials that adding carfilzomib, which is a proteasome inhibitor, a newer version of Velcade, established drug for relapse refractory myeloma. We have two trials that tell us whether adding carfilzomib to Revlimid, is that better than Revlimid alone as maintenance? And it sure seems um, that you know, if you look at the progression-free survival for standard risk patients, you can see a clear difference here. So let me make sure I can get this right. How do you press the light button on this? Is it? Oh, there we go. Sorry, forgive my uh, ignorance with this. Oops. Okay. So you can see for standard risk patients, you know, the blue line. So progression-free survival, meaning the disease staying in remission, is definitely better for standard risk patients with KR versus R. Now I kind of want to, um, you know, I'm going to like expand upon that a little bit. High risk patients. So this is, you know, I'm sure you guys heard earlier today about high risk myeloma where often the problem with high risk myeloma is not getting them in remission, it's keeping them in remission, right? So it makes sense to try to do more for maintenance to sort of keep them in remission because your initial therapy might get the numbers better, but they tend to relapse quicker. So for high risk disease, the onus is to keep the progression, to keep the progression free survival going, help keep them in remission. And in the past, so even if you look at the Revlimid data that I showed you, 
If you isolated the patients with high risk disease, they didn't seem to benefit a whole lot from Revlimid. They benefited less compared to you know, those with standard risk. So we all have been very excited about, finally we have data that for patients with high risk, and this is you know, cytogenetic, so the DNA of the cancer has those high risk features. So those patients seem to do better with carfilzomib versus Revlimid. Double hit means they have two or more of those DNA high risk features, and they also seem to do better. Based on this and some older data, for high-risk disease, we do tend to prefer doublet maintenance, so using two drug maintenance strategies. We don't have comparative data that tells us that carfilzomib is better than Velcade in this situation, but Velcade hasn't been studied in such a robust fashion. Nevertheless, I think if you, you, know, if you ask around, you know, based on our cumulative interpretation of the data, it sure seems that Revlimid and a proteasome inhibitor is what we prefer for high-risk disease. Now, now carfilzomib comes at a cost, right? Literally and metaphorically. So instead of taking just a pill, you are now coming in and getting an infusion. In one of the trials, this infusion was given twice a week. And there are lots of people that dropped out, right? That action speaks louder than words. There's also dosing schedules where it's given once a week, there are dosing schedules where it's given once every other week, which is obviously a lot more palatable than having to come in every week for years. So, you know, the PFS benefit, we still don't know whether people live longer, but the remission seems to be a little longer with carfilzomib. The PFS benefit for standard risk is, for most of us, it's not enough to convince us that we need to start adopting carfilzomib for every patient, right? You obviously have that conversation. It's not really approved, um, it will be, but it's something to think about. For high risk, you know, most of us would think that it's worth it because these are the patients who tend to relapse a little quicker, so it makes sense to do more, and it might be worth the inconvenience. But these are all feel, uh, questions that our, our field is grappling with. What about daratumumab? So you probably have heard a lot about daratumumab earlier today. Uh, it's a CD38 monoclonal antibody, has revolutionized the treatment, and it's a lot safer than some of the other drugs we have. So we don't really have solid data for you know, the type of induction therapy we use in the US, VRD, or, um, and, 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 and what daratumumab by itself adds. We do have trials that are looking at daratumumab and Revlimid versus Revlimid alone. But at least based on European data, so where Velcade, Thalidomide, and Dexamethasone was used, if you look, so basically if you, you know, the simple way to look at this curve is that these three lines are doing similarly, right? We can get into the, the weeds of it, but these three lines are doing sep, uh, uh, similarly, and this line isn't. So the red line is not something that happens in the US. This is people who got Velcade, Thalidomide, and Dex, got a transplant, and then got nothing afterwards. So there's no Revlimid. All right, so it may not apply to you, but we know that these people do a lot worse than other things. If you look at these three things, whether people got daratumumab as induction, meaning they got it for the first four cycles, as you know, with VR, VTD, or whether they got it later after transplant and maintenance, it sure seems that you know, they're, they, they sort of caught up, right? So it's very hard to apply this to today's patients in the United States. And some would argue that if you get daratumumab uh, in induction, like if you're getting, you know, dara VRD, like we really don't know how much additional benefit, to, you know, a few years of daratumumab maintenance would add. It's an open question, which is open for debate. But you definitely don't want to be like without any treatment whatsoever. That you know, you don't want to be on the red line. That's sort of what this graph tells you. Now, I know that people have different opinions about this, but in my opinion, you probably heard about the Griffin trial, right, which was daratumumab VRD versus VRD for newly diagnosed myeloma. For maintenance, the people who were previously randomized to daratumumab continue to get daratumumab, and the patients who were randomized to VRD got Revlimid. So in a design like that, you can't really, in my opinion, tell the difference between daratumumab as induction and daratumumab as maintenance. So even though you're seeing better outcomes with dara RVD and RVD, um, and dara RVD is getting dara and Revlimid maintenance, it's hard to know how much of this difference is because of the use of daratumumab in induction versus the use of daratumumab in maintenance. So again, sort of an open question for the field. We do have some trials that are combining daratumumab and Revlimid. And so we have one trial that's um, a trial that sort of is comparing DARA plus Revlimid and Revlimid. These are for people who are MRD positive. So there's some measurable residual disease left behind after induction and transplant. 
and they're looking and seeing if adding daratumumab helps in the conversion rate of MRD, okay? Do people after one year of therapy, people that were MRD positive become MRD negative? One would hope that with additional effective therapy, you sort of see that. This other trial, and this is a big trial, it's 1,100 patients, a big cooperative group trial is comparing DARA and Revlimid to Revlimid. Um, and this is actually powered for overall survival. So it will take a long time to get the answer, but this will answer the question, is it better to give Daratumumab earlier as maintenance or just wait and like give it a little later? Like is it worth subjecting patients to come in for infusions, increased risk of infection, et cetera? Um, so this will answer, but it will take a long time and the field is moving fast. The, but the other interesting thing is that this trial, the one thing we're all really excited about is that after two years, if you're MRD negative, meaning that in your bone marrow we're unable to detect any disease, there's a randomization where you can either stop treatment or continue treatment. So this, in a prospective controlled fashion, will tell us whether it's safe and effective to discontinue treatment completely for people who after two years of maintenance are in a really, really deep remission with no residual disease. So we're really excited about this. And we face these decisions today in clinic and we you know, we sometimes base it on our patients' values and preferences, and sometimes we base it on weak data, and we do sometimes take people off treatment, but this will answer it in a comprehensive fashion. We're also looking and seeing whether for those who are MRD positive, whether escalating treatment helps. I sort of showed you the design for the daratumumab study. There's also a cooperative group study looking at exasimib, and this is actually testing survival, so whether escalating treatment for those who are MRD positive, doing more than just Revlimid for maintenance, whether that helps people live longer. Again, it will take a long time, but this is an important question. Now, some food for thought, all right? This is gonna be a little controversial, not too much, but just a little bit. All right, so this is work that we did with Health Tree Cure Hub, and we asked patients what they think a cure is, okay? So this is, these results are what you all think, what 1,500 patients think. Okay, so five, um, is the, the blue color, okay? So obviously, you know, the ideal version of a cure is you permanently stop treatment and you have no evidence of disease. Most people consider that a cure, okay? What about people who are on Revlimid maintenance long term and they may not have any evidence of disease? Well, you all seem to think that that is not a cure. So continuing to take a same pill or injection, even if it has minimal toxicity and no evidence of disease, most of you don't think that's a cure. And um, it's, it's interesting that, you know, you all seem to account for toxicity in your definition of a cure. And we as physicians are sometimes short-sighted, right? We're sort of focused on, um, you know, presence or absence of disease. But as a patient, there are a lot more things that you all think about. And this is, this is a lot of food for thought for us. And it sort of, you know, should incentivize us to design trials where we try to take people off treatment as soon and as safe as possible without jeopardizing disease control because you all are telling us that if you stay on treatment, you don't think it's secure. So we already know that carfilzomib and Revlimid has a better PFS than Revlimid. We, have, we know that based on two trials. I showed you one of them, the Forte trial. So I'm sort of gonna give you some food for thought that we have all of these new drugs in myeloma. Do we need to combine all of them with Revlimid and show that each of them has a better progression-free survival than Revlimid, I would argue that's not the best use of our patients' resources. And then the other thing with trials like that is that if you have high-risk disease, I wouldn't want to put you on Revlimid. So if there's a Revlimid versus Revlimid plus something else, like, you know, we already know that PFS is better with carfilzomib and that high-risk patients shouldn't get Revlimid. So that's one thing that I really struggle with when it comes to maintenance trials. And this stuff is complicated, right? Like you have to have a trial that appeases regulatory authorities and you have to, you know, and you know, so there's like teclistimab and Revlimid versus Revlimid alone. So the problem is that if somebody has high risk disease, those are the people who benefit the most from Revlimid, but I wouldn't love putting them on a control arm of Revlimid if they have high risk disease. There's also a trial in Australia, Selinexer and Revlimid versus Revlimid, right? We already know that Revlimid plus Carfilzinib is better for those who we really prioritize a better PFS. So these trials, do they answer questions of true strategic value? That's something that I really struggle with. And then, does every drug need to be studied in maintenance? Again, that's something that I struggle with as well. You know, bilantamab has a role in heavily relapsed disease, but bilantamab comes with side effects, eye side effects, need to see an ophthalmologist. So I would feel troubled putting somebody on 
Belantum app in maintenance when I could just put them on RevLimit. And I don't know whether, Rev, you know, in a single arm trial, I won't know whether Belantum app's better. So I wouldn't want to put my patients through ocular exams and all of those things. Even if we find the right dose, like, is it really going to challenge some of the other drugs that we have already established in maintenance? So just, I don't think that maintenance, like I don't think that every new drug should be started in maintenance. Some drugs are better suited for maintenance than others. You know, if it's oral, if it has less side effects, those are the drugs that are probably best suited. But again, this is something that I sort of struggle with. So the, dial the landscape of maintenance trials is emblematic of a lot of the struggles we face in clinical research for myeloma, right? Like, what should the endpoint be? If you study overall survival, it takes a really, really long time, right? But if you're studying surrogates, like progression-free survival or measurable residual disease negativity, you should give the best treatment, right? Like, you know that you can get better PFS with something more than Revlimid, so I don't know. I, I don't love the fact that there's Revlimid and then the endpoints PFS. Control arms, this is a tough thing, right? In many areas of the world, um, you know, even Revlimid is hard to get by. So if you design a global trial, it is tough to have a control arm that is applicable and that suits everybody. And then I guess, you know, I am a firm advocate for randomized control trials and Dr. Sporoff earlier today, you know, articulated very nicely about the importance of randomized control trials. But are some trials even necessary at all? Do we need to expend a thousand patients just to prove that some drug is better than in maintenance than Revlimid alone when we already know that, you know, two is better than one for PFS in, in, in maintenance? So these are things that I really struggle with and the answers of this are really complicated and, you know, worthy of a full discussion. And then just some food for thought. We're getting close to a cure for myeloma um, in developed countries where we are leaving a lot of the world behind. So we, I, we studied this where we looked at trials that led to approval in the US. So we looked at where those trials enrolled and we found out that they enroll in a variety of countries. So they enroll in some high income countries, upper middle income countries and some lower middle income countries. But it's only in those rich blue countries that those drugs actually end up getting approved later. Even though these, you know, these orange and green countries, they contributed their patients to those trials, the drug didn't really get approved. So we are, that's a lot of food for thought and there's so many inequities in global inequity. There's obviously racial disparities, but there's global inequities that, that haunt me in, 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 in our landscape of, of clinical trials. Um, and then one last thing, so I'm, as you probably guessed, I'm very passionate about you know, advocating for better trials and better control arms and better endpoints, and we can make a difference. So you know, we've, we've published work about this, and there was a three drug versus two drug trial that was announced um, back in, I believe that was back in ASH 2020, and we basically you know, advocated, we're like, it's not okay to do a three versus two drug tri trial anymore. So after a lot of pressure, some scientific papers, they actually change their control arm. So we can do better. And if, you know, where my advocacy comes from is a desire to have more meaningful trials and trials that actually, you know, answer meaningful questions and don't hurt the patients in the control arms. Most trials are good, but there's always room for improvement. So with that, um, I thank you all for listening and I'd love to answer any questions you all might have. Yeah, we'll do that later. Okay, perfect. <laughs> all right. So one of the experiences that I get in my job that you don't get um, is I go to professional meetings like the American Society of Hematology. I'm usually a bump on the wall. Um, but one of the, the most educating parts of professional events like that for me is just eavesdropping on doctors when they talk to each other or being a part of a conversation where you really hear what they think and what they really, what their hopes and fears are and all of that. And to be honest, uh, when I thought about this segment, and it's just gonna be a little bit, I want you to get a sense of what that's like. I want you to get a sense of what it's like to eavesdrop on three really smart people, and here we have no shrinking violets. Uh, and that's another reason I thought this would be kind of fun. So I'm going to start out by just, uh, we'll take about 15 minutes or so, have a little discussion with, uh, amongst you, and we're going to eavesdrop. Very good. Does that sound good? Sure. So 
<coughs> this is a new segment, from what I understand. So, so this could be a total failure. <laughs> I'm going to do my best to make sure it's not. So because we were talking about the clap earlier today, uh, we're going to uh, we're going to carry on that theme. And instead of being this uh, calling this Ask Dr. Ruth, we're going to say, let's ask Dr. Craig and Dr. Monty. And so uh, I'll participate in the questions as well. But uh, I came up with a couple of questions that I thought could start stimulating some conversation. So Craig, I'm going to start with you. And this isn't stump the chump, all right? <laughs> this isn't stump the chump. <laughs> I don't even get the reference. <laughs> no? NPR. No? Okay, it's all right. Yeah, it's all right. All right, so. <laughs> so actually, this is exactly what happens at meetings, uh, if you guys want to know. So uh, the, the first question I have is, uh, is what's new and what's coming? Um, I think that this is always really exciting. I know that Natalie talked a little bit earlier. I didn't see her entire presentation, but, you know, when we're at a meeting, the, the the thing that we're all talking about, what's next, right? And, and when you guys are coming into clinic and you're saying, hey, listen, what is happening in the field? What, what can I expect? And I think that in each different uh, phase of a patient's treatment, new things are happening. And so I thought that we could just sort of hit on each one of these spots, smoldering myeloma, and then we can talk about newly diagnosed and, and transplant maintenance and then in the relapse space. And, and I think that that will chew up a few minutes and there's certainly a lot of information uh, to be covering. So I thought maybe we could start with, you know, the, the as Craig pointed out and I pointed out on the slide, the precancers, the MGUS and the smoldering. What's happening in that space and, and what do you see, what do you see coming, money? Do you want me to go first? Or? Okay. Uh, so uh, I think in, in, from our point of view in, in the precursor disease uh, state, you know, at, at our center in Atlanta, you know, Marov Dodabkar has a trial looking at rifaximin, which is a, a drug that has almost no side effects. It's FDA approved for irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, and it's used uh, in his view to change the gut bacteria uh, and to see if that would affect the uh, MGUS that the patient has. And the idea is that certain, certain types of MGUS are likely to be much more responsive to the so-called microbiome in your gut uh, than other types of MGUS. And, that, and doing a two-week exposure to rifaximin might help us understand how the bacteria in your gut can affect the cells in your bone marrow. And that may sound pretty far-fetched to you, uh, but there are some newer treatments uh, that stimulate the immune system where the bacteria in your gut plays a big role in how well these medications are effective in their anti-cancer uh, you know, utilization. The other new thing is that the or at least what I think is as a, a trend that I think will be useful, is that um, we are getting better and better at looking at patients who have precursor disease and pre finding predictors of patients who are more likely to develop multiple myeloma than not. And still a long way to go in this, but these prediction algorithms, these little medical calculators that we use, when I see patients with uh, smoldering myeloma, it's com so, compli so, so complex to figure out, are they high risk, are they intermediate high, are they intermediate low, are they low risk, and which points that they used to have. They are assigned to them related to their monoclonal protein, the serum free light chain ratio, the number of plasma cells in their bone marrow biopsy. All of these come and give me a prediction. Oh, oh, this patient has low risk smoldering myeloma. That's a 4% risk at two years, a 15% risk at four, at four years. I don't have... I didn't have anything like that uh, five or ten years ago. And that's all based on uh, publications and looking at data sets over the last two years. So I'm hoping that we will get better and better at picking away at patients who have precancerous disease and help better define patients who have pla aberrant plasma cells that are definitely going to become symptomatic myeloma and those patients who have, uh, you know, immunologic 
little abnormalities that are never going to bother the patient and hence continued follow-up is, is a waste of time. So trying to, in the smoldering section or the precursor disease section, uh, trying to personalize the way we uh, diagnose and follow patients. Well, it's hard to follow up on that. Um, so I guess what I'm really excited about when it comes to research for MGUS is this large randomized study that's going on in Iceland where they're screening a bulk of the population um, and they're actually um, ascertaining whether screening for MGUS improves overall survival, um, meaning that you know by picking myeloma early and like is it are we gonna like help people live longer? And it's a very important question. And you know, there are risks and benefits of screening, right? I, I see a lot of patients who get diagnosed with MGUS, and MGUS is extremely low risk, and they're almost certainly never going to progress, but they experience a lot of existential dread and anxiety, right? So we need to know whether it's worth those risks, the psychological risk, the risks of extra testing, the cost, et cetera. And this study will definitively answer that best case scenario by picking up MGUS early and by intervening on those patients who are destined to progress early, we can, you know, prevent myeloma from happening. Now, that's a best case scenario that, you know, there are many other scenarios that we could find out from this trial, but it is a very robust, large randomized trial that I'm extremely excited about. And then just to sort of echo on as far as smoldering myeloma is concerned, the things that excite me the most about smoldering myeloma are actually not the intervention trials where they're studying different drugs, but actually genomic studies, which sort of Craig hinted at where, you know, we can like tease out the smoldering that's destined to remain like MGUS, which is actually MGUS, versus the smoldering that is destined to become myeloma, it just isn't myeloma yet. We Those studies are not yet ready for prime time, but they're getting close, mm -hmm. and they will be better than our prediction models, because our prediction models, you know, they aren't perfect, right? Even the highest risk patients with smoldering myeloma, there's a small fraction of them that don't progress, mm -hmm. right? So you we, we acknowledge that by treating even those highest risk smoldering myeloma patients, we are over-treating a small fraction of patients. So those are the two things that I'm really excited about when it comes to uh, precursor conditions. I love that. So one of the things that I think may be happening in, in, in the precursor state space is that smoldering myeloma might go away as a diagnosis. As, as both Craig and Monty were referring to, we're better understanding who we need to treat and who we don't. And, and we're, we may be separating patients into MGUS and those into myeloma. And so it'll be interesting to see if smoldering myeloma as a diagnosis sticks around in the long term. Um, but these are all really interesting concepts. Um, you know, one of the other things that happens in smoldering is number one, we don't know who to treat. And number two, there's a whole wide range of treatments that are being used in the clinical trial space uh, for patients with smoldering myeloma. Uh, do you guys fall on one end of the spectrum or the other? And, and by spectrum, I say uh, there's some trials that have shown us that the Revlimid may be uh, the right choice for these patients. There's other trials that are looking at if you have smoldering disease, we're going to give you quad therapy followed by a transplant, you know, basically treating patients as if they have, um, they have full uh, myeloma. Do you guys fall someplace on that spectrum or is it controversial in your brain as well? So this is a very controversial topic. Um, so I guess I'll give my brief opinion on it. I do think that with the type of induction, mod with the type of modern myeloma therapy and modern myeloma imaging that we have today, the results of previous smoldering myeloma trials are very hard to interpret. And I am not sold um, on the concept of treating high-risk smoldering myeloma with Revlimid. I personally don't view this as a settled matter, and there are many who actually agree with me, I'm not the only one, but I think it's just very hard to apply the results of some of the older trials to the current infrastructure of myeloma treatment and imaging. A lot of the people who previously we used to call smoldering myeloma actually had myeloma because they weren't getting PET scans, they weren't getting myeloma MRIs, and we were missing lesions. Because skeletal surveys, they often don't pick up those lesions, right? And then we sort of changed the definition of myeloma in 2014. We expanded the definition of myeloma to include some people who didn't have those classical crab, you know, those kidney calcium 
uh, anemia and bone lesions, but they had you know very other uh, other findings that indicated they were about to become myeloma. Those patients used to be smoldering, and now they're actually myeloma. So the previous trials that included those patients, it's very hard to interpret the results. So I personally think that there's a lot of room for debate and it is a very controversial topic. I obviously don't want to impose my values. So I present my, you know, when I meet a patient, I sort of tell them the data, my interpretation, and some of them elect to undergo therapy, which I don't think is wrong. I just think that it's a very contentious, controversial issue with a lot of complex data that's hard to interpret uh, in today's day and age. Um, I, I generally agree. I, I, I'm lazy. Um, and so, and most of my patients are reluctant to be in the clinic. They didn't want to be there and they don't want to have interventions. Uh, and so 95 out of 100 of them will refuse treatment for smoldering myeloma if they don't have to. And I am right with them on that 100%. There are probably about five out of 100 where it's actually less stress for them to be active in their disease. They want to be, they want to receive something. They want to be aggressive. They want to be at the forefront. They want to do something. And I want to support them and be useful to them in that quest because for them, it's less stressful and uh, less risky to be active than to, than, than to be followed. Uh, and I think that the using letalidomide or revlimid as a delay tactic uh, appeals to about 5% of my patients with smoldering myeloma, and I support them with it, uh, but it is certainly a rarity. Um, in this group, though, it does select out for that 5%, and it, in this room, it may be closer to 15 and 20 percent because patients that come to these types of gatherings tend to be more active and that tends to decrease their stress. Uh, and so my job is to talk about risks and benefits and talk about ways that I can be useful in clinic. Uh, but I don't think there is one solution that's perfect for every patient. You brought up a great point. How much information is too much information? So many times you guys are coming to us and you're coming with, you know, you spent a lot of time on, on the computer and, and looking at all the data and trying to understand and, you know, you're coming to us and we've had, uh, you know, a couple of years of training and, and can sort of put uh, some, uh, uh, some different brain power and thoughts behind uh, that, that data. And one of, one of the things that I really struggle with is saying, you know, how much is too much? And, um, and, and where should you go for your information? Um, and so uh, I have my own thoughts about that, but I'm real curious to hear what you guys tell your patients. My patients, on average, they come in and they think, and it's so culturally funny to me because they say, to me before they tell me something they read on the internet. They say, I know I'm not supposed to read on the internet. <laughs> like, so many people say that. And it's strange to me because I'm desperate for them to read on the internet. I am begging them to read, to look, to be engaged, to care about their cancer and their treatment. I love it when you read things on the internet and bring them in. Nothing makes me more overjoyed uh, because that means a patient that's engaged, a patient or caregiver that's engaged. And together, if you're engaged, you live longer. And nothing makes me happier than that. So, I, I mean, the one thing I enjoyed about being in a breast cancer clinic and training was that something would show up on NBC News Tonight and that morning, you would get hundreds of calls, hundreds of calls. And many of my myeloma patients still think they have melanoma. <laughs> and they write it out. I have multiple melanoma. <laughs> ah. So if you read up on the internet, no, I am so excited. And 
there are so few patients that bring up stuff that they've read they want to discuss. I think it's, I'm tickled pink. Because it's, I, I do this all day long. I was like, oh, you want to bring up this and this trial? I was like, I sing when that happens. Because it happens every, once maybe a month. And I'm so excited when it does. So please, I, and again, this may be different from others here, but I love it if you're engaged and engaged patients live longer. So I absolutely agree with it, with, with Craig here that um, it is very refreshing when we have patients that are engaged and I thoroughly enjoy those conversations. I do have some patients here who have pretty deep, uh, intense conversations. Some of them are philosophical and you know, it's all about like myeloma and learning more and I learn more. I've learned a lot from my patients you know, in the last few years. Um, there are some patients, however, and they, they probably won't be a lot in this room who, you know, like I, I, I would argue that they would benefit from less information and they tell me, they're like, we only want to know the least amount necessary and, you know, don't burden me with more information. Just tell me what I got to do. I'm not going to look this up online. Um, so I meet people where they're at. Generally, I have an approach that is similar to Craig, but I do encounter patients. I'm sure you do as well. And if they don't want a truckload of information, I am happy to not sort of give it uh, to them. I do think that it's just, it is just so tough, especially when it comes to questions about prognosis, when then people ask me and I think the information that you're gonna get online about prognosis, or I just don't think anybody can accurately prognosticate myeloma today. I didn't come up with this, I heard this from somebody else, but you know, prognostication is like looking at the stars and what you see above is, is the past, right? So you're seeing statistics of people who haven't been exposed to some of the newer drugs, they didn't live long enough for some of the newer drugs, and then there's some drugs that are going to be approved and they're going to be developed during your lifetime. So any prognos prognosis information is not gonna capture that. So I do tell them to take especially prognostic information with a grain of salt because there's literally, I don't think anybody can prognosticate myeloma accurately today. We all try, we have our models, but it is a tough job. Um, so, yeah. How are we doing? I don't know if I have a concluding statement. I thought it was successful. Yeah, yeah. These, these guys are talkers, so it made that easy. Um, but I think that next time we should do a little bit longer. I've got a whole laundry list of you questions. You want to tell me short. Yeah. Well. <laughs> ah, thank you. Well, that went pretty good. Uh, and I think you see, you know, it's, it's kind of neat just to hear what they think uh, and really understand, because that stuff doesn't really fit into lectures and talks. So we're going to take a 15-minute break, come back. Uh, we have Dr. Christina Gowen who's going to be joining us virtually, and we're going to go right from that to the last Q&A, um, and then we can all pat ourselves on the back for having it made through today. So go out, have get 15 minutes to relax, come back. Last, you made it this far, you're going to love the rest of it.
what can I do to intervene? What can I do to cool this inflammation that's going on? And I like to think about nutrition as really the first stepping stone towards that. And Hippocrates got it right, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. And I love that. And I love this picture because it really it shows the spectrum of color that's available within our foods, um, all of the fruits and vegetables. And so I often, when I counsel the patients, tell patients to eat the rainbow. And I say, that doesn't mean the skills, people. <laughs> <laughs> eat the rainbow of fruits and vegetables. And that is because each of these colors have a color because they, re they really represent a different phytonutrient. And they carry different um, vitamins, minerals, nutrients that are synergistic in this anti-inflammatory, um, in, a, in a synergistic kind of way. And so I, I like to show this picture, encourage patients to eat all fruit tons of fruits and vegetables from multiple different varieties to be changing up the variety seasonally. Um, and again, that's trying to get at the heart of inflammation. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the Mediterranean diet, but inflammation can be cool to diet, and we've seen that with a Mediterranean-based diet. And we've seen that manifest in, even in the bloodstream, measuring markers of inflammation, such as BRP, interleukin-6, tumor necrosis factor alpha, and other markers of inflammation. And so this is so it's one of the biggest trials ever done in a dietary intervention. Over 7,400 patients with high-risk cardiovascular disease. This is a primary prevention trial, and they looked at those that are eating the highest quartile of the Mediterranean diet, we increase the right types in fat and crude. Lots of anti-inflammatory foods, fruits, veggies, nuts, olive oil, fatty fish. And look at the bottom, not too much of those fried foods, sodas, refined carbs, processed foods. And so if you look at these uh, survival tips, it's really incidence of cardiovascular inflows, so major cardiovascular event or death. And those that were eating the highest quartile of the good foods, of the Mediterranean foods, which you see in the green curve, had a much lower incidence of this uh, cardiovascular endpoint. Well, how does that translate into cancer? This is not a randomized controlled trial, so that is a disclaimer, but they did do a sub-analysis looking at incidence in this trial, and those that, again, were eating these highest quartile of the Mediterranean diet plus extra virgin olive oil rather than nuts, which I didn't mention in the prior trial, but it really is. The olive oil really is a potent anti-inflammatory. But here you can see that the incidence of breast cancer was much lower with this kind of dietary strategy. In myeloma, we don't have a randomized controlled phase three trial uh, yet. I think that will come. But this was a really interesting study looking at pre-diagnosis dietary pattern and survival in patients with myeloma. So there's 423 multiple myeloma patients, and they looked at what kind of foods were they eating, and they did food questionnaires, and then they looked at for their myeloma-specific mortality. It was significantly lower with a healthier dietary pattern, 15 to 24%. So when we're thinking about diet, you know, some patients will say, well, there's not enough evidence. And I, I say, well, that's probably true. We don't have our big, strong, randomized, phase three, interventional Mediterranean diet yet. But what is the risk? What are we risking with only taking a Mediterranean-based diet? Um, we see from large um, cardiovascular studies that it's modulating inflammation, and we know inflammation drives symptoms and cancers. So why not? Right? Why not? And so I definitely recommend a Mediterranean diet, and this is the, the Center of Integrative Medicine at the Andrew Wild Center at the University of Arizona. Uh, they're an anti-inflammatory diet group here, and then there's a few tweaks within here, which I think are really um, interesting in that uh, they're highlighting a few components. So it's basically Mediterranean, but they're really highlighting a uh, cruciferous family, and so lots of cruciferous vegetables, and why is that? Well, we know that cruciferous vegetables have the potential for 
And so fluoxetine is a very potent antioxidant drinking activator. And so we're actually studying this here at the University of Arizona as a chemo preventive in head and neck cancer. And so, um, you know, maybe a, a half cup to a cup per day of the super herbs. And when I say that, that's broccoli, cauliflower, bok choy, kale, uh, Brussels sprout, they can it kind of in this way. Lots of berries, um, tons of flavonoids and berries, antioxidants and berries, but very low sugar people. Um, healthy fats, certainly the extra virgin olive oil, I like to highlight lots of omega 3. Omega 3 most potently are in fatty fish, however, can also be obtained within salt sources such as chia, hemp, walnuts, ground flaxseeds, um, which I encourage patients to use. Whole soy foods, and my own also lots of controversial issues for uh, endocrine causing tumors such as breast cancer, prostate cancer, and some controversy out there. But in general, large observational studies actually say that, that there's a lower incidence with the consumption of whole soy foods. And so things like soy milk, whole food, tempeh, um, edamame certainly can be consumed um, as a part of the healthy diet. Asian mushrooms are really interesting. They have this thing in their sun ball called beta D glucan, which actually is a potent stimulus for the immune system and a potent stimulus for the tumor response. And so uh, I there's many supplements out there, and some patients choose to take supplements. I am a food as medicine person, so I love the idea of people doing this mushroom. It seems like shiitake, maitake, oyster mushrooms, potentially tend to be this benefit to blood risk. Plentiful herbs and spices, particularly turmeric, cinnamon, ginger, garlic. It's a, a hormone positive tumor growth mainly. Um, can be consumed for good medicinal benefit. Green tea. Green tea, EGCG. This is another controversial issue because there's that lovely blood paper that looked at the interaction with or targeted on green tea. If you do the math though, that poor mouse would have consumed 100 cups of green tea that day. And so whether that really translates into that something, an interaction that occurs within a human, I am not convinced of. And so I think, you know, in moderation, green tea can be consumed as a part of a healthy diet. Uh, I, I could possibly spend our whole time talking about uh, nutrition, so let's move on. I love nutrition and I love uh, recipes, but let's move on to physical activity. So I like to share this study. This is a systematic review and meta-analysis looking at many different physical activity interventions and mortality in breast and colorectal cancer because that's where we have the most data. And this is a forest study, and this is a relative risk of cancer specific mortality. And you can see everything is solid on the left of that forest plot, so a reduction of that risk. And so it really is independent of what the intervention was looking at, and these cancer survivors that their mortality actually was lower with an exercise intervention. Not only cancer specific mortality, but also all cause mortality. And so again, when we're talking about interventions for weighing risks and for weighing benefits in any therapeutic, whether that be a new bug specific or it is an integrative oncology intervention. And when it comes to diet and when it comes to exercise, undertaking that kind of diet, and an exercise program which is safe and monitored um, and really intuitive for the patient, right? You don't want to overdo it, you want to listen to your body, you want to talk to your doctor but something to enhance movement for very low risk and potential benefit. Here is a study in multiple myeloma for physical activity. It's associated with less comorbidity, better treatment tolerance, and improved response in patients with myeloma undergoing a positive tensile transplant. And so they defined 150 minutes and some strength training, and they found that there was improvement of key treatment tolerance tolerance, decreased cost of stay, and even overall and progression-free survival. Uh, this was actually a retrospective analysis, so we need um, an actual study looking at more uh, physical activity interventions, which is true in all of these physiologic diseases, not only multiple myeloma. 
I have an ongoing Tai Chi trial for for my enrollment for patients undergoing a pelvic painful transplant, and we're actually looking at markers of the immune system being modulated within that trial. So what are the recommendations? I recommend that again, physical activity be undertaken in an intuitive and communicative way. Talk with your doctor, talk with your team, get a buddy, try to figure out what it is that, that makes you joyful when you're moving, how can you make it as fun as possible, and listen to your body and try to, if possible, incorporate cardiovascular strength and flexibility, and I love meditative movements such as yoga, qigong, or tai chi, because that is engaging the mind and decreasing stress at the same time. So we already, we fit the bulk of our time in the body, and I'm going to try to tie in the mind, joy, and meaning, and complementary therapies as well. Stress triggers inflammation. Going back to that idea, we need to fuel inflammation, and how do we do that? And we know that our mind and stress is a potent, potent stimulus for inflammation in our body. The fear response, the stress response, we need this cortisol, epinephrine, norepinephrine, which goes into the bloodstream and it actually modifies the tumor microenvironment. And so what happens is we know that there is more blood vessels around the tumor microenvironment, there's less migration of our immune cells, there's more migration of cancer cells. If there's viral replication, there's enhanced viral replication. And so stress truly manifests in a very physiologic way in the body and in a specific tumor microenvironment. And so anti-stress medicine is good medicine. And the first key is to recognize it, right? And we all hold more stress than we give ourselves credit for. Or <laughs> maybe not credit. We all hold more stress that we need to relieve. And so I encourage you all to However, the method that works for you, whether it's a smartphone or a sticky throughout the house to say, wait, take a moment, where am I in this moment? Am I in a stress response or am I in a relaxation response? And if you find yourself in a stress response, if you're hunched over, your palms are sweaty, you're tense, you're planning, 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 or ruminating, and not in the present moment, then take a moment, step back, do some deep breathing. I love to teach four steps. And we don't have time today to talk about that, but essentially it's as intuitive as it sounds. You breathe into the count of four, you hold that for the count of seven, and you breathe out for the count of eight. You do that four cycles. That's a YouTube video as well if you want to see Dr. Andrew Lau doing that on his couch with his dog. <laughs> it's quite frankly. Um, and our recommendation is start at the beginning of the day and the end of the day because it is like a muscle. It gets stronger the more you use it. And so when you most need it in that stress response, it's a sharpened tool. But I also recommend tons of different uh, modalities to engage in breath work or meditation, the calm, headspace, insight timer, all of these applications that are out there. Mindfulness-based stress reduction programs that are out there. Probably the most evidence based my body intervention and so on today is mindfulness uh, based stress reduction. They're all spiritual care. And we know that those <coughs> excuse me, are engaging in something that connects them outside of themselves, whether that be nature, spirituality, religion, these other. <coughs> do better with their uh, chemotherapy, their treatment tolerance, have lower rates of alcohol and drug abuse, lower rates of depression, anxiety. And so really focusing in on what it is that you're connecting to and having that relationship every day is also powerful medicine. So I recommend a 10-minute intervention in that meeting. And then joy. Joy is probably the most fun pillar and is overlooked. And joy really has the capacity to transform our experience and our lives. And focusing on what brings us gratitude and happiness every day makes it more accessible as we're moving forward to claim it in the moment. 
So I tell patients to do a joy practice where they name something joyful, they do it, and then they reflect back and say, ah, oh, that was really rich and beautiful and wonderful. So once per day, a joy practice. And then a gratitude exercise, whether that be a gratitude journal, a gratitude uh, practice in the morning before getting up, or there's an app out there called Free Good Things. And that's been correlated to higher happiness scores. So really, how your practice of gratitude is, is called medicine and it's evidence-based medicine. So that's the really body, mind, joy, meaning. I just love this speed of light. <laughs> it gives a ton of, of complementary parallelity. And we certainly don't have time to jump into all of these. But I would say acupuncture is probably my go-to. I personally do acupuncture. I refer almost all my patients for a trial of it. It's good for fatigue, neuropathy, um, psychosocial issues, depression. And so I find it very helpful. Um, but chemicals is usually a big uh, topic of discussion. And I will refer you to Memorial Sloan Kettering's website about herbs as well as a natural medicines database where you can get evidence based information about all the chemicals. But I think that the biggest key is communication. You want to be talking to your team about what are the chemicals you're taking, if you're taking them, and if they're safe. And we did an integrative medicine survey with Health, uh, Health Tree, thank you so much, which hopefully will be published soon. It's under review. Uh, but notice how many patients were actually undertaking some sort of uh, supplements. 50% of those surveyed in the 178 patients that were surveyed were taking curcumin. And a significant portion were not disclosing that to their provider. So again, it underscores the, the uh, need for communication within the population. So to end my talk today is really to eat intentionally. Eat beautifully with lots of colorful foods, lots of omega-3 fatty acids. Can use often to breathe, manage stress, sleep well, cultivate joy, and be open to new and innovative modalities of healing. So thank you so much for your kind, kind attention. Let's let me know if you want to get a hold of me and ask me any questions. You're welcome to. And again, thank you so much to organizers for inviting me. It's really an honor. Can you unmute? Oh. So we're going to. <laughs> it's the new disco sound. There, it's working now. Uh, Dr. Gohan, can you join us for the QA? I would love to. Okay, then we'll get started. I'm going to start with. Uh, is this echoing too badly? Oh, can can you please mute when you're not speaking, Dr. Gowen? Thank you. Uh, it's not. Now it works. No. I don't know that we're going to be able to make this work, Dr. Gowen. I'm sorry. Let's see. We're trying one more time. Better? <laughs> we'll give you 30 seconds. It's not going to work. Dr. Gowen, we're going to have to say goodbye and let you have fun with your children. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> This is why they require us to still. What's going on? Can you turn her off? Now. Now there's nothing here. Well, I don't know what that was. It's red. Oh, it turned red. Just press it again. There. There. All right, folks. <laughs> I've got, now I've got to find my questions.
Uh, I'm going to start with two uh, online questions, uh, and then if you have any questions, please uh, let me know. We have a number of online questions. Uh, but this one, where did it go? This. Oh my goodness. I can't find the question. I was just trying to find it. It disappeared. Oh, that's too far back. Okay. I remember what the question was. <laughs> the question is about maintenance. Um, how long on maintenance? How do you know when to stop maintenance? When should you start talking to your doctor about these decisions? And because you need this. Hmm. So many unknowns. Um, currently, we consider maintenance therapy to be indefinite. And I know that this is a big question uh, for all of you guys because we're you're saying, well, I mean, I've got to be on Revlimid or some such drug for the rest of my life. I mean, come on. Not only is it expensive, but it causes all these toxicities with fatigue and diarrhea. And I think that, you know, the data is one thing that we have in front of us. And so, um, you know, I know that Emory does things a little bit differently than, than we might do here. Um, but for right now, <laughs> which, listen. Right it's not an attack. <laughs> just, just. They're, they're, they're very proactive. Um, <clears throat> but I think it's very clear, and Monty brought this point up, is that there's, there's very likely patients who are able to stop early. And there's also patients who likely require ongoing maintenance therapy. And there's likely patients who require ongoing multi-drug maintenance therapy. And I think that these are all questions that we're trying to get at. Um, Monty also brought up uh, one of the trials, um, uh, the SWOG S1803 trial that's is asking the question of, okay, well, what happens if we stop maintenance therapy in some of our patients based upon um, on MRD status, so minimal residual disease? How much disease do you have left in the bone marrow? And I think that, um, you know, this is an, an area of ongoing research. And I will tell you that every single one of us across the board, even though, you know, there's the old saying, if you line up 10 myeloma physicians, you know, in a line, they're all gonna give you a different answer. I think that across the board, it's very clear that we want to figure out who we can stop maintenance therapy on. Um, I just don't think that we have that data in front of us right now. So, um, yeah, so that's a great answer. It's tough to build upon that. Um, but when I, so when I look at the landscape of maintenance trials and a lot of the data for maintenance, as I mentioned during my talk, comes from an era where we didn't have such good initial induction therapy. So I think that at some point it is worth revisiting, and I know that there are discussions going on, we probably will see trials in the future, where you give people a finite amount of intensive therapy, be that one year or two years, and then you just stop treatment altogether after that and just see how, how people do. That is what I sort of envision, um, like the future of myeloma treatment, hopefully to look like, and that's sort of what patients want as well, right? Because if you're on treatment, you don't think of it as a cure, even if you don't have any, any disease. Um, so these are really, really tough questions, and we don't yet have really good data to, to, to guide us. And I think, as Doug sort of pointed out, uh, an individualized approach based on the data that we have uh, and based on the patient's individual values and preferences is how at least I approach maintenance. I don't, I'm not sure what the crack about Emory was, but <clears throat> the, I didn't say anything bad, it, just, to, just to start that off. Uh, so I think, and we basically are doing what you both said, is that we personalize treatment in my own clinic, patient, in that rare patient who has low risk disease and has a spectacular response. I don't give them any maintenance, and that's, different after transplant, for instance, and this to, you know, is contrasted with patients who are of high risk disease, didn't get a great response. I put them on two or three drug maintenance. Uh, so 
personalizing for the patient and what they're both able and willing to tolerate uh, is, I think, the, the message, honestly, from all three of us. And then actually, I'd, I'm actually going to go two more questions because this other one was kind of related to that as well. Uh, again, this is a patient who's in remission, uh, has been on maintenance, um, but the doctor is pushing for a stem cell transplant. What are the patient's options if they do not elect a stem cell transplant and they have done stem cell collection? Yeah, this is a real common thing. Uh, so you're in the midst or you just completed induction therapy or initial treatment and I'm talking to you, hey, now would be a reasonable time. Things are as good as I expect them to be in terms of patient's functional status. What do you think about transplant if I haven't talked about it before? And some patients are like my mom. If my mom had myeloma right now, I would say, hey, you can come into the hospital and get treatment, and she would have stopped me right there. She's like, electively go in the hospital? No, I don't electively go in the hospital. Certainly not for anything that could cause nausea. So that would be end of discussion. No discussion at all about transplant. So the, th and what happens predominantly, what you read on the internet is, oh yeah, if I do transplant or don't do transplant, eh, it's about the same thing. And in truth, that is weighted for what's published. And what's published is not what people live. What people live is that if you either, the people that are thinking I'm gonna do transplant up front, they do transplant up front. And the people who say, I'm just gonna collect, because this idea of transplant sounds crazy. That never changes and they never go on to transplant. So that's what happens most of the time. That data is not easy to find because all the trials are about transplant early versus late. It's not transplant or no transplant. And so what I tell patients is that transplant provides them a 20% boost in overall survival. If you have a three-year overall survival because you have high-risk disease, it's 20% of three years. If you have a 10 to a 12-year overall survival, it's 20% of 12 years, which is a lot different. Either way, transplant provide, boosts your survival about 20%. It's not going to cure the myeloma, but on average, it's going to prolong survival at significant cost uh, to your quality of life, whether it's in the hospital, fatigue, energy, et cetera. So in my own practice, I tell patients this and say, are you really sure you want to collect stem cells? Because if you want to collect stem cells and store them, you're probably never going to undergo transplant anyway. And it may be increased risk of going through the collection and storage process that you don't need to take. This is probably very different than my colleagues. <laughs> So, <laughs> yeah, he's going to polish this one off for sure. Just, I'll, I'll just bring up one point, one counterpoint to not collecting. I think that um, at least with our patients who are getting CAR T cell therapies, um, these are late, late line patients. Their bone marrow has been beat up. Um, there is a risk of prolonged um, cytopenia, so low blood counts. And, uh, and in some patients, they may benefit um, from having some of those stem cells as, as an insurance policy that's sitting in the freezer. And so in general, um, the, the discussion that I have with my patients is very similar uh, to the one that Craig brought up. Um, but I do think that if patients are electing to not undergo transplant early, um, I, do, um, I do recommend that we collect their stem cells and at least have that insurance policy in place. All right, so um, so <laughs> I am generally for up upfront transplant. Let, let I'm going to start off by saying that, lest I be misinterpreted. Um, I and I generally do agree with Craig that clinical trials are not representative of what happens in the day-to-day -day life. I will, however, say that you know if you look at some of the recent trials um, and if you look at all of the really good new treatments that we have for myeloma the you know the four drug induction that we're doing 
there definitely are patients who are going to do really well. They're going to have prolonged remissions, and they may not need a transplant. And if somebody is really averse to the idea of chemotherapy, and they, we give them high quality, you know, four drug induction therapy, and they get a really good response, and they may or may not collect stem cells. I do generally push for stem cell collection because I want to keep all doors open in the future. Um, but you know, you could make a point that things are only going to get better. So in the sense that let's say somebody gets four drugs today and they get a remission that la and they don't do transplant and they get a remission that lasts like you know four years or five years. Well, it could be that by the time their their disease comes back, we will have other things that are approved for first line for for first relapse, such as CAR T or bispecifics. That's very plausible, and then they'll get that, and then they'll get a very very long time of remission with that and they can live out their entire lives without ever being subjected to chemotherapy. Now, there are a lot of assumptions that I'm making here, but I do think that the current data does allow for some degree of individualization based on patients' values and preferences. And I think I weigh this differently based on standard risk versus high-risk myeloma. There definitely is some you know, subsets of patients that I feel like are very uncomfortable with them not undergoing transplant. But for some patients with standard risk myeloma, if, they, if they're averse to the idea, they understand their risks and benefits, they're willing to undergo collection, I, don't think, it's, I think it's perfectly okay to collect stem cells and, and hold off on, on, on transplant upfront. But this is a very complicated discussion and it requires hours with each individual patient and understanding their values and preferences. So I obviously cannot do justice to it in a, in a short you know, three minute answer. And this will be, and think about your questions, and I'll start, you know, signal me after this question, please. Um, can cannabis be helpful to treat pain for patients in treatment or someone who is post-transplant and asymptomatic? Who wants to go there? Give it to the young guy. Just because just I have long hair, I guess. <laughs> That's the we're, only reason. We're making a lot of assumptions it's here. It's the bow tie. It's the bow tie. <laughs> I guess long hair is okay. <laughs> so j the, the short answer to this is yes, that uh, cannabis definitely can have a lot of pain relieving properties. Um, I don't really, you know, there's some people who will claim that cannabis has the, you know, has the cure for myeloma and there's some people swear by it. I don't know if I believe that, but cannabis definitely can cure, can help uh, control pain and can definitely reduce dependency on other pain medications. And for some people, it works really well. So I am not opposed to patients trying cannabis to help, to help and augment their pain control. <laughs> I said before, I used to have long hair. <laughs> the, uh, so I think that the, the disease itself and our treatments cause a lot of toxicity. And and one of the most important things that we can do for, for you as patients is, is try to optimize your quality of life. And, and there's a lot of different ways that we can do that. I know that Christina talked about um, uh, some, you know, some alternative therapies and you know, breathing, meditation, uh, exercise, all these different things. So, so very important. One of the things that we one of the tools that we have now is is um, is THC, and it's been very effective for some patients. Other patients don't derive any benefit, uh, but it's not just pain. It's it can be neuropathy, it can be nausea, um, it can increase appetite. You know, so it has uh, it has a place, uh, especially for some patients. Um, and, and now that we're able to to prescribe it, um, I think it's something that's worth trying for some people. Questions? Uh, well, we'll start here, and then I'll go up there. Who'd like? And I'll hold the mic uh, for you. Uh, you all were talking about the transplants. Uh, the the lady that was here uh, earlier from Wisconsin, uh, she was saying that that the stem cells don't need to be perfectly healthy or whatever like that. And what was your thoughts on that? You're saying the way you're talking about it, it sort of inferred that the stem cells had to be perfect. I don't remember. I don't remember. Uh, you're talking about Dr. Callender that was here earlier. Yeah, I don't remember that statement. Um, that might escape. 
Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think I, I necessarily have a statement only because I don't remember uh, her saying so. Um, you know, I wonder if, if there was a question about myeloma stem cells or, or that piece of it. Um, you know, it was the CAR T. Um, yeah, uh, so I think it's a different concept. Yeah. yeah. Oh, did you want to? I guess the, the short answer to your question is that in the past, we've tried techniques to sort of purge, you know, myeloma cells from the stem cells, and they haven't really been all that helpful. Um, and generally speaking, if somebody is going to a transplant, we don't have to have eradicated, you know, all cancer before taking them to a transplant. And sometimes efforts to eradicate cancer can delay and sometimes even take transplant off the table. Mm -hmm. So that's one problem that we do see in the community. So one message that I always like to spread uh, is that, you know, you should see a transplant doctor or a myeloma specialist, you know, after, like pretty early on, within three to four cycles of therapy, so that we can talk about a transplant. Your disease does not have to be in a complete remission mm -hmm. at the time of transplant. Mm -hmm. um, just one point I really wanted to emphasize. Yeah, no good point. Very good point. Yeah, I'll run back there. I think it's probably easier to do it this way. <laughs> and I'm gonna hold the mic. Thank you for your earlier discussion on precursors and smoldering. Um, so you mentioned in, that you're excited about the clinical trials looking at genomics. Is that something that's available here in Utah or easily accessible for those trials? And I'll give that to a Utah doc. <laughs> um, so these genomic uh, studies where they look at, you know, a specific gene profile for patients with smoldering myeloma, um, they are not yet ready for commercial use. A lot of the good work that I'm personally aware of is, you know, I, I know that some researchers at the University of Miami are doing some pretty innovative work in coming up with, with these assays. Um, the, we do have a clinical trial here for smoldering myeloma. Um, I don't think that that clinical trial uses genomics or has a genomic component to it. So I don't personally think that I, I have that test available for, for my patient, but, but it's definitely something that we're excited about and will hopefully be used in the future. Yeah. Uh, so one thing that we are doing here, um, we have the Utah Population Database, which is an enormous resource, and one of our, our colleagues, uh, Dr. Nikki Camp, um, has been doing a lot of work trying to identify germline or inherited mutations that may be associated with MGUS uh, and other plasma cell dyscrasias. Um, and so some of the work that we're doing when we're collecting samples from our patients as part of the biobanking uh, is, is looking at that fundamental question. Um, and so those are some of the active things that are happening. A little bit different than the question that you were asking, but yes, we have enormous resource here in Utah and we're trying to, we're trying to tap into that. Uh, this is a question we actually get a lot, and it's, it's, it's more of a speculative question. Uh, do you foresee a day when there is a myeloma vaccine? That's going to be a short one. Well, we've tried viruses. Um, people are exploring vaccines. Um, I think that the technology, um, I know enough about the technology to say yes or no. Um, but I think it's, a, it's an interesting idea, um, and I know that it continues to be explored. I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. Nothing useful. <laughs> <laughs> this is what David Avagon is working on, is that right? There's a, there's a specialist in, in Boston named David Avagon who is really the pioneer in this, and he's pretty much the only one who's really super focused on it, as far as I know. Um, at what... Um, one topic we haven't touched at all today is allogeneic transplant. Um, so the first one to answer, if you could explain what allogeneic transplant is to our audience. Uh, and secondly, at what point in the treatment and under what conditions do you recommend an allo transplant for relapsed refractory myeloma? And since you're shaking your head, I'm coming over here. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so, um, allogeneic, so autologous transplant is what most myeloma patients have heard of. They get high dose chemotherapy. They get some of their own stem cells right back to them. They head right back to the bone marrow and reconstitute or repopulate the marrow. The idea behind a donor transplant or allogeneic transplant is that you're replacing your immune system with somebody else's, completely repopulating it. Uh, so giving some chemotherapy, infusing somebody else's stem cells, and then giving, suppressing your immune system so that their immune system uh, can take over and ideally go where your immune system couldn't go and see your cancer cells as foreign and kill them. Um, the idea sounds fabulous, uh, and the it's associated with something that's not so fabulous, which is graft, which is the stem cells versus host, which is you. Uh, and that's not ideal. That's when the stem cells not only realize that your cancer is foreign, uh, but they also think of you as foreign, and they attack you. Uh, it's your own civil war. Uh, and the problem with myeloma, which is different than with uh, genomically simpler cancers like uh, chronic myelogenous leukemia uh, and somewhat acute leukemia, is that myeloma is very immunosuppressive. The cells in and of themselves, their existence is a fabulous immunosuppressant, which is why myeloma patients are always thought to have an infection, uh, because they often do. And so, immunosuppressive, so they prevent a lot of the graft versus tumor effect, the new immune system attacking your myeloma cells, and they don't really uh, stop the graft versus host. So in the majority of time, in most myeloma patients undergoing allogeneic transplant, you get all the pain and suffering of graft versus host disease for none of the benefits of graft versus tumor. Uh, so that's the, the deal with allo allogeneic transplants. The people who I would encourage to head towards allogeneic transplant are those patients where there is an interesting clinical trial investigating allogeneic transplant and changing something fundamental about that graft versus tumor, in some way amplifying the ability of the new immune system to attack the tumor. That would make me excited as a, pati as a patient and a doctor and would make me interested in referring that patient for donor transplant. <laughs> I love it, I love it. I feel like I'm back in high school. Don't, not me, not me. Um, as a male Caucasian, this is the, uh, the, the person asking the question. As a male Caucasian myself, what is your hospital doing to solve the problem of twice the number of African Americans being diagnosed, treated, and dying of myeloma than whites? Are there any advances in knowledge uh, about genetic predisposition in our disease? And I know you all three are doing this, so who's going first? <laughs> Right, so this is an area of active investigation. Um, so just to sort of recap uh, the facts, the facts are that um, African Americans are twice more likely to get myeloma precursors. And then if they're getting, you know, most, all myeloma originates from myeloma precursors. So African Americans, unfortunately, have a higher burden of myeloma. And there is a lot of work going on to try to understand why this happens and a lot of the information that we have on you know, myeloma precursors comes from a predominantly white population. So the bulk of our studies have come from um, Minnesota and you know, that original cohort by which we defined the natural history of MGUS was 97% white. So those facts may not apply to a diverse population. So I know that um, you know, in New York, there's a study called the PROMISE study going on, which is screening, um, you know, those considered high risk for myeloma. So that includes African Americans and patients are um, being screened. And there's a lot of translational research that's going on that will help us understand these myeloma precursor conditions better. 
And that's one step to fixing the problem, right? Like you wanna, you, you don't wanna end up diagnosing more pre-cancer, more cancer, and then not having access to therapeutics. So that is a completely separate issue that, um, you know, we've been talking a lot about this, we're raising awareness, and we're hopefully starting to make progress. But we absolutely have a lot more work to do, but thankfully a lot of work is being done to help understand these myeloma precursors in an African-American population, which is different than the original studies by which we learned about MGUS. I think I'll just make one, uh, just one small point. Um, I think that uh, disparities is, is becoming um, an increase, increasingly recognized issue. And, and racial disparities are, are on top of that list right now. And, and so a lot of the clinical trials are mandating that there are specific cohorts um, for, say, African-American patients. And so we're trying to understand how our drugs are working, not just, you know, in, in all comers or in a predominantly Caucasian um, group, but also uh, specifically in, in patients, um, in African-American patients. And so I think that there's, there's increasingly amount of work being done, and, uh, and I know that we're all focused on, on trying to identify the problems um, and trying to uh, increase the amount of data that we have available. Uh, so we can increase understanding. Do I say anything, Craig? No. Uh, there was a question. Oh, boy. <laughs> now. Now they come out as we get near the end. Oh, brother. <laughs> I've got, a, I've got a question about trials, and through the course of this workshop today, it's become evident that I think all of you have mentioned that there's a need for everyone's, everyone, there's need for more, for more trials, to get more data, to understand the disease. So my question is, is the, is the reason that some of these trials aren't existing today or they aren't in the pipeline, I mean, is it an infrastructure issue? Is it a funding issue? Is it a... You know, what, what, what is it about the trials that, you know, that's required to get out there and get this data? Oh, he was I was, uh, sorry. I was, tr I was trying to be an active listener. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. So, the good question about trials. Uh, so, myeloma is 2% of all cancers, and about 3% of myeloma patients, on average, uh, get access and enroll in a clinical trial. Uh, so there are more, you, uh, turn 360 degrees, throw a dart in any direction, you're gonna hit a problem with our clinical trial complex. Is it too much regulatory issues, not enough infrastructure, not enough funding, not enough uh, patient, inter, you know, patient advocacy, or, or in, uh, sorry, incorporating patients uh, to advocate for proper trial design. You know, there's nothing that's going well, or nothing that we can't improve on uh, in the clinical trial sphere in myeloma. Uh, and because it's not as many patients, the, there are glaring problems that, don't, that aren't potentially as difficult in breast cancer. Because breast cancer, there are thousands of patients that you can mobilize in a heartbeat. And same place, right, but fewer number of patients expose our clinical trial deficiencies, and so there's a lot of work to do to make things better. So I, I generally agree with all of that. Just some more food for thought, and it's something that I think about a lot is, um, so, you know, the bulk of funding for trials comes from industry. And um, there's very limited government funding for clinical trials. The government funds more basic research, which has incredibly important, but there's very limited funding for clinical trials. The priorities of industry are obviously, you know, to help patients, but they're also to advance their products, right? And a lot of the times we end up with trials that, um, that may not answer questions of strategic value. Um, so like really important questions in the field of myeloma are like, what are the patients for which we can do less therapy, right? Like what are the patients through which we can individual, individualize therapy? But when industry makes a trial, with some exceptions, usually they 
are incentivized to do more therapy, more therapy for longer periods of time, and cast a broad net. So these individualization and these you know, smaller cohorts, they may not like serve industry the best. So that's a problem that's not unique to myeloma, it's a problem unique to you know, all clinical trials, that what is a strategic question may not align best with who is funding the clinical trials. And sometimes you get trials that don't answer questions of strategic value. And I kind of hinted that when I spoke about maintenance, it's, it's, it's a problem. Uh, I will say that there's been, I think, a fundamental change in the clinical trial space in myeloma. You know, 20 years ago, your clinical trial was uh, you can have five different types of chemotherapy followed by one transplant or two transplants followed by a bunch of other toxic therapy. And so what's happened, you know, we've had just this rapid, uh, this rapid momentum and progression with our, with our drugs. And so uh, that combined with more education and better patient understanding, I think patients are seeing clinical trials as, a, as an option, right? And it's a, it's a very feasible option, and there's, it's possible that we're, they're going to be getting very effective therapeutics that they may not have been getting 15 or 20 years ago. So, you know, while it seems that, yes, we don't have enough clinical trials and things aren't moving fast enough, when you put it into the scope of where we've been in myeloma in the last two decades, things are moving at an extremely rapid pace. And, and we have, you know, and that's 15 approvals, you know. We have bispecifics, we have venetoclax, we have all these other drugs that are coming very quickly. And so we're making a lot of progress. And so I don't think that... Um, I see it as a very, um, you know, I see it with rose, rose lenses, right? Because I think that we're making a lot of progress. Uh, uh, boy, oh boy. I'm going to go here. I'm going to start here. Oh, oh, oh thank you. Um, when we talk about standard risk versus high risk, um, what's the criteria to be considered high risk? So, for example, uh, high LDH level can independently, I think, throw somebody into high risk versus the chromosomal abnormalities. So, when we talk about the progression free survival for high risk versus standard risk, what, are, what makes up that high risk population? Now you're just trying to start a fight. <laughs> There's nothing more contentious than this question in our meetings. And, you know, nothing, I, literally people yelling at each other about how to define this. When, wh how high risk do you need to be for us to change our initial treatment to be multi-drug maintenance, etc.? So I'm sure amongst the three of us, we don't agree. Um, and the, so one consideration you know, I'll throw out some things that I put in my high-risk category that had a, I had on my slides. The revised ISS stage 3, the extramedullary disease or disease outside the blood and bone marrow, uh, patients who have greater than 5% circulating myeloma cells at diagnosis, um, and, you know, patient... Uh, and a number of, you know, amplification of chromosome, uh, of the long arm of chromosome one in patients with ISS stage three, all these little details. And so I'm sure amongst us we're not going to agree, uh, but LDH is a component of the revised ISS stage, as it sounds like you know well. Uh, and it is one of the, thi one of the lab tests that uh, we use that uh, contributes to how difficult to treat a uh, patient's myeloma is. And, and I, I, I agree completely. <coughs> there's so much that we, we still don't know about risk, right? There's so many factors that contribute to risk. And our current risk stratification models, although they're getting better and better, but they're not perfect. So there are some patients who we classify as high risk, but they do as well as standard risk patients would do. And then there's some patients who we classify as standard risk, but they end up relapsing early, which goes to show that there's no perfect model that we have that accounts for all aspects of high risk. Um, and yeah, so we're, we're working on it. We're, you know, we're developing better systems. So I won't go into too much detail, but you know, over the last year, we've had two new staging systems for myeloma come out. And they, the, the key advantage of these staging systems is that they account for some of the additive nature of these risk factors. So previously, stage two myeloma used to be this big heterogeneous group 
um, you know, stage one and stage three, yes, you'd be able to tell clearly, but stage two, just like the majority of patients fell in there and some of them were more like very standard stage one type and some were stage three type. But now we sort of have the granularity to sort of delineate that stage two myeloma further. So one of the newest staging systems, what we call the R2 ISS, or the second revision of the international staging system, that actually has four stages now, and that accounts for some of these cumulative risk features. I mean, I don't think we're disagreeing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, I think we're all on the same page with this. I think that. The only thing that I would add is that, um, you know, the proof is in the pudding. And so, um, you know, speaking to Monty's point, some of our standard risk patients actually have high risk disease and they, they, re, they relapse or progress early. Um, and so we are surprised uh, by some. And it, it just speaks to the importance of continuing to monitor patients, keep our eyes on them, um, and, uh, and, and, and just be aware uh, that that's a possibility. And so, um, you know, this just speaks to the importance of just ongoing care with your, with your provider. I know we have more questions, and what I'd like to ask you to do, the doctors, if you wouldn't mind sticking around and maybe answering them personally, that would be really fabulous, because we've reached that time, uh, and I know there are people are, this has been a long day. It's been, an, it's been a very emotionally and intellectually straining day, I know that. One of the things when you organize these kind of meetings, from my point of view, you have to decide what you're going to leave out. We left out a lot about myeloma today. We didn't even talk about minimal residual disease, and that's a big issue. And that's okay, because my philosophy, I taught middle school and high school, and my philosophy as a teacher was always, I wanted my kids to know a lot about a little so that they could make their own decisions in life, not a little about a lot that was just superficial. And I think that's hopefully what you saw today. Uh, and the last thing, two last things I want to say. The first phone call I ever had with Jenny uh, was the most important call I ever had. Uh, and we didn't know each other. And we just had a philosophical discussion about stuff. And the thing that struck me, and it strikes me to this day, is that she never, ever, ever thought the answer to this was money and more research. Her idea from the very beginning and it started with crowd radio and her picking up the phone and calling up experts around the world basically to educate you about clinical trials, is the way she was going to get cured is by getting everybody engaged in their disease. Because then you will benefit from the knowledge from her and she will benefit from the knowledge from you and you will all benefit from each other. And I think that's a remarkable uh, paradigm shift. Because a lot of times people say, well, you know, I need to go out and run a fun run and raise some money for research. This is a whole different thing. And I think you saw that today with the idea. Imagine that from that conversation, we now have Health Tree Cure Hub. We are going towards a revolution. I am so convinced that will change the disease world. Uh, last thing I want to leave you with is you always have to balance the small picture, me the patient or you the patient, with the big picture of the great optimism in myeloma. And sometimes they don't fit together. But you just have to keep that in mind. And I want you to remember two things. When I started out in myeloma in 1998, there were between 35 and 40,000 Americans in the United States living with multiple myeloma. A year ago, when I looked at the stats, which only went up to 2017, I estimated that by the end of this year, there would be 170,000 myeloma patients living in the United States. With the statistics that just came out very recently, which didn't take into account 2018, so they skipped from 2017 to 2019, it now is realistically, it, it, it is, we can now expect at the end of this year, there will be 220,000 Americans living with myeloma. That's 50,000 more than I estimated a year and a half ago. So the big picture is changing remarkably. But we, in this foundation, we focus more on the small picture as much as we can. So I want you to remember that. There's things to feel good about, and there's things where you just have to constantly be vigilant and be as optimistic as you can and help each other out. And with that, I'm gonna pass it on to the one person who started all of this, uh, Jenny Alstrom.
Well, I want to thank <clears throat> I want to thank Greg for organizing this meeting, and he runs our roundtable program. So let's give him a hand for. <laughs> And can we please give another hand to these amazing professionals? <laughs> I would say we would not be here today without their research, um, without them running the clinical trials. And we need to continue to assist them in performing that work. So um, participate in clinical trials and consider donating to their research. But also, patients can make a major contribution by um, sharing our myeloma stories with each other and coming to faster conclusions. So I think it's <clears throat> part of whole. So thank you so much for coming today. Thank you for spending your Saturday. Thanks to these amazing doctors for participating. Um, I'm just so appreciative of everything they do. And I get overwhelmed thinking about how they've dedicated their lives to helping us. So, yeah. thank you. Take all the t shirts and free food you Thank you for joining us for today's Health Tree Roundtable for Multiple Myeloma. You can re-watch this meeting on our YouTube channel or by visiting healthtree.org. We'd like to thank our myeloma experts who have volunteered their time to help educate myeloma patients like you. We'd like to thank our sponsors once again for their continued support, and we invite you to attend future roundtable events. The Health Tree Foundation for Multiple Myeloma provides a set of rich programs and tools for all myeloma patients at every stage of care. We put patients first in everything that we do, from the creation of new programs to the design of our tools. Our programs are meant to accomplish two goals, to support and educate patients and caregivers, and to advance a myeloma cure. We've created remarkable programs that we hope help you become a better self-advocate so you can obtain your very best outcomes. As a myeloma patient myself, these programs are what I wanted when I was diagnosed. I hope you can take advantage of these very valuable resources to successfully navigate your myeloma and to help us accelerate a myeloma cure. The Health Tree for Multiple Myeloma news site is a news feed of relevant information about myeloma in patient-friendly language. We are lucky that so much development is being done in myeloma, but that also means we need to stay up to date as things are changing quickly. Subscribe to the weekly newsletter so you can follow major advancements, read patient stories, Use the search button to search over 10 years of information about myeloma. Find a myeloma specialist for a second opinion in our directory, or learn from additional resources on this valuable site. The goal of our Health Tree for Multiple Myeloma Community Events program is to connect, educate, and support patients and caregivers on different aspects of myeloma. We have chapters or different groups based on topic or geographic area that meet regularly online. For example, we have geographic chapters in Southern California, Florida, and the Northeast, Southeast, and Mountain West regions of the United States. We have chapters that meet based on topics of interest like fitness and nutrition, immunotherapy, or even stages of diagnosis like a chapter for newly diagnosed or relapsed refractory patients. We have chapter groups dedicated to rare forms of myeloma or related diseases like amyloidosis, non-secretory myeloma, and plasma cell leukemia. We also have chapters for African Americans and patients that speak Spanish. Forming these groups creates a powerful bond a larger network, and incredible research opportunities as we join together virtually and occasionally in person once a month. It's a privilege to get to know so many myeloma patients, caregivers, physicians, and supporters intimately and support them in their journey. 
I absolutely love my job. Health Tree Myeloma Roundtables are live patient education events featuring top myeloma experts. They're designed to provide in-depth and accessible overviews of the landscape of particular myeloma issues for novice and veteran patients. Myeloma Roundtables teach about particular topics in myeloma, not just basics. They help put things into context for patients to learn and understand more about their disease and how to best live with it until cures are achieved. Whether you're newly diagnosed or relapsed refractory, want to learn about myeloma testing, genetics, side effects, or the latest research in cutting edge therapies, Myeloma Roundtables are for you. Each has moderated discussions, and the best thing I think about our Myeloma Roundtables is that they always have extensive time set aside for the audience to ask questions of the full faculty. This allows for interaction among the speakers and often provides insights that can't be found in papers and studies. Our goal is to help you ask the best questions so that you can have more productive visits with your healthcare team. We host six Roundtables each year throughout the nation and we live stream, record, and post each event on our website. We call them roundtables because we believe everyone touched by myeloma, patients, caregivers, family members, researchers, physicians, nurses, and anyone else who comes into contact with myeloma patients deserves a front seat at the table when it comes to the best diagnosis, the best treatment, and a realistic path to a cure. Whether you are a caregiver or a myeloma patient, the Health Tree Myeloma Coach Program is designed to help you find one-on-one -on -one support to fit your needs. You might be looking for emotional support, more information about myeloma, or just someone to talk to. No matter what you're looking for, coaches are trained volunteers and offer their personal experiences and resources to help. You can find a coach in your location or with specific areas of experience that would be helpful to you. You can connect in a way that works best for both of you, by phone, email, video chat, or in person. You might even want to become a coach yourself to help someone else on their journey. Orientation and training are provided to the coaches using our extensive Health Tree University curriculum, so answers to common questions are never far away. It's the personal experience that sets Health Tree Myeloma coaches apart. Having myeloma can feel so lonely and isolating. When my husband was diagnosed with myeloma over seven years ago, I wanted to talk to someone who was close to my age, balancing children at home, working and caregiving, to learn how they did it and what had helped them. I wanted to talk to someone who could personally relate to what I was experiencing. The Health Tree Myeloma Coach program can provide these types of connections. Knowing there are others who can relate can make all of the difference. I love leading this program because it truly helps us meet people where they are, provide personalized resources and support, and shows patients they can live a happy and full life, even with a myeloma diagnosis. Educated and empowered patients tend to have better outcomes. Health Tree University for Multiple Myeloma is designed as an online myeloma curriculum to meet all myeloma educational needs. Whether you are a newly diagnosed myeloma patient or a myeloma patient expert. Health Tree University includes dozens of online courses with hundreds of lessons. Each course consists of multiple video lessons focused around a single topic. These lessons are taught by the myeloma experts who are world renowned and treat hundreds of myeloma patients each year. They are the leading researchers in the field with their findings being published in well-respected medical journals. The lessons also include video animations and graphics to help make difficult concepts easier to understand. Quizzes follow each lesson to evaluate the understanding of the topic. Health Tree University is continuously updated as the myeloma landscape changes. We are constantly interviewing myeloma experts at our roundtable meetings and key myeloma academic meetings to keep the curriculum up to date. When I was diagnosed with multiple myeloma, I believed in Dr. Knows Best and I blindly followed my doctor's orders. As I've become more experienced, and as a former teacher, I realize the importance of arming patients with the information in Health Tree University. I want you to make informed decisions and